Professor uh, Peter Gruss, uh, the president of OIST. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Or as we say in Japanese, Ohayo uh, gozaimasu, or in Okinawan, uh, lower degree of complexity, uh, high sai. So welcome to OIST the Okinawan Institute of, for Science and Technology. It's a privilege and honor to host that famous conference this year and on our campus. With over 400 participants representing many different countries, this is one of the largest string conferences to date. Had we not been forced to close registration early because of capacity of our audience, this would have been probably the largest string conference ever. I want to particularly thank the people who helped to get that meeting off the ground. It was initiated by Hiroshi Oguri and Hirotaka Sugawara, who suggested to bring this conference to OIST. But I'm also particularly grateful to the organizers of this conference, including the executive committee, the local organizing program committee, the fellowship selection committee, and the international advisory com committee. In particular, I'd like to thank Professor Hiroshi Oguri, Professor Leonardo Rastelli, and Dr. Yohei Morita for their tremendous work to organize such a brilliant program. My gratitude, of course, also uh, includes the local staff who made that OIST um, uh, conference possible. This is an especially important year for Strings, as 2018 marks the 50th anniversary of the development of the Veneziano model and the birth of string theory. This year's program features many exciting talks from prominent scientists regarding different aspects of string theory. I'm very pleased, hence, of the quality of the researchers that are in attendance today, including a Nobel laureate and a Fields medalist. But I'm also particularly impressed by the next generation, by the young scientists. The quality of your research impressed the conference organizers so much that they significantly increase the number of fellowships granted this year. Thus, you should be particularly looking forward to hearing these early career students and scientists during the so-called Gong Show. They are remarkable presentations of the next generation of theorists. I wish you a productive and lively conference, and I hope you leave here being inspired and invigorated by new ideas that will undoubtedly come up during the course of this uh, conference. If you have time, you should, of course, study our oyster strings. Our oyster string, you will find, is our logo, and that logo is the Sisha. Sisha is a lion dog, and it's a symbol for protection. So this lion dog is not just protecting oyster, Today it also is, and the week, is also protecting this conference. Take the time to come and visit our beautiful institute. If you have more time, look at the beautiful island above the ground, particularly the north is very much natural still, but also below the ground. This is one of the best places if you want to go and see the coral reefs and the coral fish. So I hope that despite this, the, the program, the tense program, you'll have some time to relax, have discussions above and below the water, and I wish you all the best for this conference. Thanks for coming again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, President Gross. Uh, so once again, so on behalf of the executive committee of the conference, uh, I'd like to welcome you warmly to Spring 2018. So OIST has been our generous host of this conference, and I'd like to thank Professor Gruss, uh, 
Dr. Yohei Morita, the Acting Vice President for Communication and Public Relations and staff member at OIST uh, for their support for the conference. For this conference, we have introduced a new way to select speakers. Rather than choosing speakers by ourselves locally, uh, we appointed a program committee consisting of 11 young theorists, most of whom, not all, spoke at the Strings 2017 last year. The program committee chaired by Leonardo Rasteri worked hard over the last 12 months and did a fantastic job in selecting plenary and review speakers. The committee, have been, committee has been very thorough and careful, and I'm also impressed by the effort paid to maintain the integrity of the selection process. Of course, any grievance you might possibly have about the program should be directed to the executive committee and to me. Uh, I have several announcements to make. Uh, Today, uh, as uh, Professor Gru said, uh, we'll have the gong show followed by poster session plus the reception. Poster session and the reception will take place together. I should say we received 142 applicants to the gong show and chose 18 of them after a rigorous selection process. So they are really distinguished a group of uh, next generation of theorists. Therefore, uh, to enjoy food and drink at the poster session, your attendance to the gong show is prerequisite. The list of poster uh, presenters will be made available after we verify today that all registered posters have indeed been posted. So please go ahead and post them to make sure that your name will be listed. Uh, similarly, uh, the list of all participants will be made available after we, have, uh, we make the final confirmation of registration this morning. On Wednesday, we are planning a special cultural event with classic music and dances of Okinawa. We'll start with two short lectures, uh, one on the history of Ryukyu Kingdom by Dr. Fumihiko Taka, uh, Sato, who is a historian at Okinawa Prefecture University of Art, and another on the history of classical performing arts in Okinawa by Mr. Ichiro Nakamura, who is a president of the Okinawan Classical Music Association. This lecture will be followed by a variety of music and dance performances. Program will start at 6.30 p.m. In, the auditorium, in this auditorium. And more about the cultural evening program, including the list of music and dance performances, and their description have been posted on the conference webpage, so you can look at them. On Thursday at 7 p.m., uh, right before we open the banquet, We'll pay homage, homage, excuse me, homage to the three distinguished colleagues who passed away this year, Peter Freund, uh, Stephen Hawking, and Joe Polczynski. So in order to do this in memorial uh, respectfully, uh, please make sure to come to the banquet venue at the Rizan Hotel before 7 p.m. and remain quiet while eulogy are uh, given in their honor. Uh, so please note that uh, only those who have paid the banquet fee can consume food. So no free food at the banquet. Uh, uh, actually, I have four more uh, housekeeping announcements. Uh, we are making small changes to uh, shuttle bus schedule. Uh, starting this evening, the buses going to and from Kariushi Beach Resort will not stop at ANA Intercontinental Manza Beach Resort. And the new shuttle bus schedule with all these changes uh, have been posted on the website that you can, you can check. Wi-Fi is available throughout this campus. Uh, if you have an account on EduRoam, that is a recommended Wi-Fi. Uh, we also have the OIST-public, which can be used without password. Please not enable the tethering option, whatever that means of your mobile phone, no other mobile Wi-Fi router, as they will choke up the bandwidth for the official OIST Wi-Fi. During the conference, we are providing uh, lunch boxes. Uh, for those of you who have told us about your dietary restrictions, uh, we have special table for vegetarian and halal foods. Please do not take these lunch boxes if you have not signed up for them. We have a limited number of them and our staff member will be checking names on the list. 
For participants with babies, uh, we have a parent's room for breastfeeding, diaper changes, and other parental needs. Uh, it is one of the three rooms available on the bottom right. So if you go out from this exit, uh, it's right over there. If you are not sure where it is, please ask our staff member. Uh, okay, so uh, there are a couple of other uh, uh, notices here. Please do not bring uh, uh, food and wi uh, wine, not wine, but uh, anything uh, in, in this auditorium. And make sure if you have a poster presenter, please post them just outside of this auditorium. Etc. Okay. So when we started the planning for this conference, that was four years ago. Uh, one of the first things we did was to study long-term weather data in Okinawa to choose an optimal week to have this conference. So I'm very pleased to tell you that the Japanese Meteorological Agency announced in the weekend that the rainy season in Okinawa has officially ended two days ago. In response, uh, Zoha Komargovsky wrote to me yesterday saying that with such an accurate and early prediction, I think people aren't entitled anymore to saying that string theories do not make falsifiable predictions. <laughs> with that, I hope you enjoy the conference and the beautiful campus of OIST. And thank again for Peter Gruss for hosting this conference. So now I turn the microphone to Leonardo Rasteri, the chair of the scientific program committee. We'll share the first session, please. Welcome, everybody. So we are glad to start the first session of the conference with a review talk by Francesco Benini. The title is not up, but he will review dualities and dynamics in two plus one dimensions. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so thank you very much the organizers and the scientific committee for inviting me. So it is for me a great pleasure to lead off the dance to, with the first talk of this conference. And uh, uh, what I would like to do uh, in this talk is to review some of the recent progress in our understanding of the infinite dynamics of certain gauge theories in uh, two plus one dimensions. And, uh, uh, well, in particular, um, about Chen Simon's gauge theories with uh, scalar and fermionic matter fields, mostly in the fundamental representation. Uh, let me also stress that uh, I will stick with a high energy point of view, so I will work with standard relativistic uh, quantum field theory in the continuum. And also, let me apologize in advance if I will miss some of the uh, important references. Uh, hopefully, I will, I will not. So, of course, understanding uh, the infrared behavior of uh, uh, this theory is interesting from the theoretical point of view. Uh, but, in fact, it turns out that it also has uh, phenomenological applications. In fact, at least some of these theories are used as effective field theories in various condensed matter problems. And here I'm just listing a few. Uh, for example, quantum phase transitions of uh, spin liquids and quantum magnets, high temperature superconductors, edge modes of topological insulators, and the physics of the half-field lambda level. Now, in fact, very recently, it was even proposed, at least at the theoretical level, how to engineer uh, some of these theories on uh, bilayer films of uh, graphene. And in particular, apparently, one can engineer QED with arbitrary Chen Simons interaction and an arbitrary number of uh, fermionic fields, which is uh, quite quite interesting. Okay, so um, much of this progress um, has been driven by uh, the formulation of some conjectural infrared dualities. And by this, I mean uh, uh, the high energy use of the term, which is stronger than what is sometimes uh, 
done in uh, condensed matter physics. In particular, by a duality, I mean that we have two or more uh, theories, which are different in the UV, they have different Lagrangian description, however, they flow in infrared to the same physics, at least for some range of their parameters. And uh, uh, well, these dualities are particularly interesting and particularly powerful when this infrared physics is a CFT, because then Im they imply uh, an equality of a full set of correlation function for a, a full-fledged CFT. Um, an important role in, in this story will be played by Toft anomalies uh, for global symmetries. And, uh, well, in fact, uh, we are used in the supersymmetric context to the fact that there are many quantities that we can compute exactly with various techniques. Uh, but, of course, this is not so in uh, uh, non-supersymmetric theories. However, Toft anomalies are one example. So let me start quickly reviewing a uh, particle vortex duality, which is probably one of the oldest dualities. So on one side of the dualities, we have the O2 vector model. This is a theory of a complex scalar with quartic interactions and a mass term that we can tune. On the other side of the duality, we have a gauged version of the same theory. So the complex scalar is coupled to an abelian gauge field. And uh, uh, let me introduce a notation that I will use in this talk. So I will indicate the gauge group, the Chen Simons level. In this case, it's zero. There are no Chen Simons interactions. And uh, I will indicate uh, complex scalars with the letter, sorry, with the letter phi. So this uh, duality, in fact, contains some beautiful physics. So first of all, we can try to study what happens in these theories where we change the mass. And in particular, we can, uh, at a semi-classical level, understand what happens when the mass is very large compared to the other scales uh, in the problem, in particular the gauge coupling or the quartic interactions. So in the vector model, when the mass squared is positive and very large, the system is gapped. When the mass squared is negative, instead, uh, we are in a broken phase where the U1 symmetry that rotates the scalar is broken. In fact, the very same phases are reproduced in the gauge theory, uh, but in a different way and uh, uh, with an opposite sign of the square mass. So when the square mass is negative, the theory is Higgs, and so once again, is gapped. And when the square mass is positive, uh, the scalar field is massive, we can integrate it out, we are left with a free photon which in fact is dual to a compact scalar, and this is a theory that spontaneously breaks the, uh, the, the shift symmetry of the, of the scalar. Now, in the, in the vector model, if we go in the massive phase, there are uh, perturbative excitations. This is the, the massive particle created by phi. And in fact, these excitations are reproduced in a very interesting way on the other side of the duality, because they are finite energy vortices, so they are solitons. Uh, and uh, uh, correspondingly, the fundamental field phi that creates this particle is mapped to a monopole operator on the other side. And the U1 symmetry that rotates the scalar is mapped to a magnetic symmetry on the other side. This is a symmetry whose current is the odd dual of the field strength. Now, um, as we said, uh, in this theory, there are two phases, semi-classically, when the mass, of the mass squared is very large. These two phases are different, so necessarily there must be a phase transition in the middle. But in fact, in the O2 vector model, we know that this phase transition is a second order phase transition. And uh, the CFT at the phase transition is the O2 with some Fisher fixed point. And so, if uh, this duality is correct, is a full fledged uh, uh, duality in the high energy sense, then this has a very uh, interesting and non-trivial implication, which is the fact that also in this gauge theory, there is a second order phase transition. This is not obvious. And moreover, that this phase transition is described by the very same with some Fisher fixed point. As you said, this is a very non-trivial thing, um, uh, statement. Uh, but in fact, there are uh, many checks of this. There are also some uh, support from Lattice Monte Carlo uh, simulations. Now, an important role in this duality is played by monopole operators, so let me quickly uh, give you, uh, uh, remind you what, what they are. So they are local disorder operators, so they are defined by boundary conditions for the gauge fields and the other matter fields in the theory. In the path integral, 
at the insertion point where we want to insert the, the monopole operator. Um, if you are dealing with a CFT, alternatively, you can define the Miralia quantization as uh, states uh, on the sphere uh, with magnetic flux turned on. Now, uh, since um, gauge bundles on the sphere are uh, classified by the fundamental group of the, of, the, of the gauge group, this leads to a group of conserved charges, so charges are conserved by the monopole operators, and in particular to a magnetic symmetry. In fact, the simplest example is uh, an abelian gauge theory. In this case, the magnetic symmetry is a U1. In fact, as we say, that the current is just the odds dual of the field strength. Uh, but in other cases, this magnetic symmetry can be discrete. For instance, for uh, orthogonal gauge, group, uh, gauge groups, this symmetry is, uh, is a Z2. Now, it turns out that uh, the semi-classical monopoles, so defined, can have electric charges, in particular if there is some Birch and Simons interaction in the Lagrangian. And because of this, they are not gauge invariant. Now, in order to construct gauge invariant operators, we need to dress these semi-classical monopoles by uh, zero moles of the matter fields. And in this way, the monopole operators can acquire uh, both spin and uh, global symmetry quantum numbers. A very important mechanism in two plus one dimensions that was discovered long ago is flux attachment. And the physical idea of flux attachment is very simple. So if you have some particles and we attach to them one unit of magnetic flux, then this changes the statistics of the particles. And this is easy to understand. In fact, if we try to move one of the particles around the other one to exchange them, then we pick up a phase by Aaron of Bohm effect. Now, uh, one way to uh, realize in practice this, uh, this mechanism is through Chen Simons interactions. Let me consider this very simple example. So let's consider again a complex scalar coupled to a U1 gauge fields, but this time with a Chen Simons interaction at level one. So in this case, the semi classical or bare monopole operator is no longer gauge invariant. And so in order to construct a gauge invariant operator, we need to dress it by one zero mode of the scalar field. However, the zero mode of the uh, scalar field, the lowest Landau level on the, on the sphere with one unit of magnetic flux, has a spin one half. And so in this way, the basic uh, gauge invariant monopole operator, in fact, is a fermion of spin one half. So this realizes the uh, flux attachment uh, mechanism. Now, the flux attachment was uh, originally devised and uh, proposed for massive particles in first quantizations. But in fact, uh, some years ago, it was proposed that we, could, uh, uh, we should upgrade uh, this mechanism to the status of a full-fledged duality of uh, uh, CFTs. And in particular, it was proposed the following duality. Uh, that if we consider U1 gauge theory at level one, so level one to Simon's interaction, with a complex scalar, uh, quartic interactions and a, a mass term which is suitably um, tuned, in fact, uh, the monopole operator that you saw before, which is a fermion, becomes a free field and so in, in the infrared. And so this theory, in fact, is dual to a free Dirac fermion. So in particular, if this uh, proposal is, is correct, this means that in this theory, as we tune the mass uh, of the scalar, we hit a second order phase transition, and the second order phase transition precisely corresponds to a free Dirac fermion. Uh, in fact, uh, other versions of these dualities uh, were proposed, in particular a version where the role of the fermion and the scalar is, is exchanged. So for instance, it was proposed that if we take, uh, once again, a U1 gauge field, this time a level one half, and in particular notice that because of the parity anomaly, here it is a fermion, uh, the quantization of the chen simons term is in terms of uh, half integers. Well, it was proposed that this theory is dual, uh, this time not to a free theory, but to the two, uh, O2 vector model. Uh, and so in particular, uh, if this is true, this implies that as we tune the mass of the fermions on this side, once again, we hit a second order phase transition, which is the O2 with some Fisher fixed point. In fact, we can regard 
these uh, dualities as uh, um, versions of the particle versus duality with fermions. Now, it is also proposed a version, which is a fermion-fermion duality, in which a gauge fermion is dual to a cofermion. OK. So, uh, more or less at the same time, uh, some uh, very interesting progress was made, was being made in a different direction, which is uh, the understanding and the analysis of vector models at large n. So in particular, there are two very simple theories uh, that we can consider. One is a theory of free fermions, in particular k-free fermions, and let's focus on the singlet sector under OK. The other theory is a theory of scalars, uh, but this time let's consider the, the critical theory, in which there are also quartic interactions, so the ON uh, critical vector model. Now, it turns out that in these theories, at large n, or, or, or large k, there is a high spin symmetry. Now, in fact, this high spin symmetry is exact uh, in, the, in the free theory, even for, uh, for any value of k, uh, but uh, uh, it only exists at large n on the other side. It's broken at the order 1 over n. Now, because of this high spin symmetry, uh, there are conserved currents in the theories. In particular, there are conserved currents with all even spins, and the form of, these, uh, of the currents is, uh, is uh, schematically written here. They're quadratic in the metal fields. In fact, it turns out that all primary operators in these theories are products of these currents and of a scalar operator with just the uh, um, quadratic uh, invariant, the mass term. Now, starting from these two theories, we can consider two one-parameter families of uh, the formations. So in particular, we can take each one of these theories and we can couple them to Chen Simon's gauge fields. So in particular, OK on these sides and ON on this side. And we can study these theories in the Toft large n limit, in which both n and k are large, but the ratio is fixed. And in this way, we can create two one-parameter families of, uh, of uh, deformations, um, which uh, break uh, parity. Now, the important uh, understanding and proposal that was made was that, in fact, these two families uh, are dual to each other. And uh, in particular, we should identify the two families up to inverting the top coupling. This is a very interesting proposal, uh, but in fact, one can give very strong evidence for this duality at large n, because it turns out that uh, correlation functions uh, are uh, solvable at large n. And this is due to the high spin symmetry. So first of all, one can show that the spectrum of primaries in this theory is independent of lambda, of the Toft coupling. Uh, but even stronger, one can, in fact, fix, almost fix, uh, correlation functions. So for instance, if we look at three-point functions of uh, single trace operators, this object here, well, it turns out that they are essentially fixed by high spin symmetry. So there are only three tensor structures that can appear in these correlation functions, and the coefficients in front of these three tensor uh, structures are fixed by the high spin symmetry up to two coefficients uh, that I call C1 and C2, and these two coefficients are some functions of the parameters in the theory, here n and k. And so then, as a matter of determining what this function is, one has to compute a couple of correlation functions. This can be done. One can fix this, uh, this relation, and so one can prove that, in fact, by comparing in the two theory, in the scalar theory and the fermion theory, one can see that all correlation functions, in fact, agree. Now, this is very uh, strong evidence for the duality. Uh, of course, this evidence is valid at the CFT point, but, in fact, one can find other evidences, even away from the CFT point. For instance, one can compute thermal partition functions away from the CFT point, and again, in the large n limit, these uh, thermal partition functions agree. This is uh, very nice and uh, extremely interesting. Now, of course, uh, in the large n limit, we are blind to many details. For instance, uh, there could be some order one shifts of n and k in this identification, um, uh, in this duality map. Moreover, the story that I told you was for real uh, matter fields, but in fact, there is a similar story for complex matter fields. In this case, we couple these matter fields to 
uh, unitary or special unitary uh, gauge fields. And in the large and limit, we don't see whether really the duality works for unitary or special unitary or uh, this kind of details. However, it turns out that, in fact, these details can be fixed. For instance, uh, one can look at how monopole operators and baryonic operators transform uh, in the duality. And so, putting together uh, the input from these large N dualities and the input from these uh, dualities that were proposed uh, in condensed matter, this generalization of the particle vortex dualities, was possible to uh, propose uh, precise infrared dualities between Chen Simon's uh, gauge theories with matter fields in the fundamental representation. And so uh, here is one of the proposals. So in this proposal, on one side of the duality, we have a gauge theory with special unitary gauge group, SUN level K, with NF complex scalars in the fundamental representation, quartic interactions, and a suitably tuned mass term. While on the other side of the duality, we have uh, unitary gauge fields, UK at, at some level, with complex fermions, again, in the fundamental representation, and a suitably tuned mass term. Now, these dualities were conjectured for a number of flavors which is not too large, it's less than a bound, and in particular, in this particular case, uh, it is less than the rank of the gauge group on the scalar side. And we will come back to this bound in the second part of the talk, and we'll see what happens if we try to go beyond this bound. Uh, but in any case, so this is one of the proposals that were made. In fact, there are other similar proposals, so other versions of these dualities, in which uh, essentially the gauge group is different. So there are uh, some versions in which there are unitary or special unitary gauge fields, and the matter field is complex. There is a version with the uh, symplectic gauge fields, and the representation is pseudo-real. There is a version with the orthogonal uh, gauge fields, and the representation is real. So uh, now, as we did before for the particle vortex duality, we can try to understand what are the phases of these theories as we change uh, the mass term that we can uh, tune. And in particular, it's easy to study uh, this phase in the same classical regime in which the masses or the mass squared is large compared to the other scales in the theory, in particular compared to the gauge coupling and the quartic interactions. And uh, what we generically find are some gap phases uh, with some topological sector, so some Chen Simons TQFT. And if we compare these topological sectors uh, coming from the two dualities, in fact, they precisely match thanks to the rank duality of uh, TQFTs, uh, which is a duality that we can um, rigorously prove. Now, um, it is less trivial to understand what happens uh, in the quantum region, so uh, when the masses are small. And part of the conjecture is that, in fact, there is a single transition here, essentially because there is no sign of, of the fact that another transition is needed, so the picture is consistent. Of course, uh, it's quite a non-trivial question to ask what is the nature of this phase transition. It could be first order or second order. Now, for some of the dualities, so in some of the cases, in fact, if we believe to the dualities, they predict that the, dual the, the transition should be second order. So in particular, in dualities where one of the two sides are just free fermions, or one of the two sides is an ON vector model, well, if the duality is correct, then the transition should be second order. But in the other case, we don't really know. However, as we said, the conjecture is much, so the dualities are much more powerful if the transition is second order, because they imply an equality of a full set of correlation functions. And so in the following few slides, I would like to assume or conjecture that, in fact, the dualities are second order and see what interesting physical consequences or prediction one can draw from, from, from them. So one interesting... Uh, physical consequence is a full set of uh, examples of bosonization of free fermions in two plus one dimensions. So these, if you wish, are generalization of uh, the, one of the particle vortex dualities that I presented before. And in particular, in this theory, is one of the, uh, in, this, in this example, one of the two sides of the dualities are just free fermions. 
So in particular, this means that the duality is answering, for us, the question of what is the effective field theory of the gauge theory at low energies. It becomes just a theory of free fermions. And uh, well, there are examples where these fermions are uh, Dirac fermions, but there is also a version with Majorana fermions. And so in particular, in these cases, if the dualities are correct, as I say, they imply that the transition, phase transition in the gauge theory is second order. A similar class of example is given by fermionization of Wilson Fisher scalars. So in these, in these examples, a uh, known side of the duality is infrared free. However, on one of the two sides, there are no gauge fields. So in particular, here there is either the Ising uh, theory or the O2 vector model. And we know that in these theories, there is a second order phase transition. Moreover, uh, nowadays, for instance, with uh, techniques like the uh, conformal bootstrap, we know how to compute a lot of things in these, in these fixed points. And so if we let me say that these fixed points are uh, almost solved, once again, the duality is if correct, answer for us to the question of what is the infrared physics in these, uh, in these gauge theories. Another uh, interesting consequence is the phenomenon that uh, asymmetries can be enhanced at an infrared fixed point. And, uh, well, of course, um, we are used to this kind of phenomena, uh, especially in the context of supersymmetry. However, in general, if I give you some field theory, it's a very hard question, it's a very hard task to say whether the symmetry will enhance at a fixed point. Now, of course, if we have enough supersymmetry, we can have some arguments or some techniques to detect this enhancement, but without supersymmetry in general, it's very hard to say. However, sometimes dualities can make this enhancement, or at least part of this enhancement, manifest. So in particular, I have in mind two uh, cases, two types of situations. One situation is uh, the one in which we have two theories, theory A and theory B. Uh, however, the, the, the symmetry in theory B, uh, which is manifest in the Lagrangian, is larger. So then, if the duality is correct, in particular, if uh, the two theories flow to the same infrared fixed point, this implies that in theory A, as we flow to the fixed point, there is an enhancement uh, of the symmetry. A slightly different case, which is, if you wish, even more interesting, is when we have theory A and theory B, they have different global symmetries. However, these global symmetries do not commute uh, uh, in the infrared. And so, once again, if you flow to a fixed point, it means that the symmetry there must be larger, it must contain both, uh, both symmetries. So, in fact, I can give you examples, uh, draw from, uh, from, uh, from the dualities of both types of phenomena. So, the first example is QED with one fermion. And in particular, let me consider QED at level three halves. Now, uh, in the UV, the global symmetry in this theory is O2. This O2 comes from, uh, so there is a U1, which is the magnetic symmetry, and there is a Z2, which is charge conjugation. Well, it turns out that this theory has many duals. And in particular, one of them is SU2 gauge theory, again, with a single fermion. Now, since SU2 has pseudo area representations, it turns out that in this uh, theory, in particular in the UV, the symmetry is larger, it is SO3. And so once again, if it is true that the two theories flow to the same fixed point, this means that this fixed point must be some CFT with SO3 symmetry. So here I'm also assuming that, this, that the symmetry is not spontaneously broken. And so in particular, this means that in the abelian theory, as we flow to the infrared, the symmetry is enhanced from O2 to SO3. Now, if this is true, um, since the algebra of this symmetry uh, becomes larger, we should have more conserved currents. And in fact, we can detect in this theory the uh, monopole operators, which have the correct quantum numbers to become the new conserved currents at the fixed point. Because we cannot prove that these monopole operators really become conserved currents, so we cannot prove the dimension goes down to two, uh, but at least the candidate operators with the correct quantum numbers are there. The second example is QED with two fermions, and this time uh, at Chen Samus level zero. So this is a parity invariant theory. So in this theory, the global symmetry in this UV turns out to be O2 times SU2 mod Z2. There's also time reversal that I'm neglecting here. Um, so, um, 
This will be discussed in more details in the next uh, talk. And, uh, well, once again, this O2 comes from the magnetic symmetry and charge conjugation, while this SU2 uh, directly acts on the, on, the, on the matter fields. Now, it turns out that this theory ha is uh, self-dual, so it is dual to an identical copy of itself. However, in this duality, the O2 is exchanged for a copy of O2, which is diagonally embedded into SU2. And so, in particular, if the duality is correct, this implies that, that this O2 is enhanced at the, infinite, at the infinite fixed points to a full SU2, which is manifest in the dual description, and so the symmetry in the infrared should be O4. And in particular, this O4 is not visible, is not manifest in either description. And once again, we can detect or identify uh, the monopoles, uh, monopole operators with the correct quantum numbers to become the extra uh, conserved currents. Now, uh, not only um, internal symmetries uh, can enhance in the infrared, uh, in particular, uh, even symmetries that act on space-time, so in particular time reversal. Uh, and in fact, we saw an example of this before. Uh, the very uh, bosonization dualities are an example of that. In this case, we have a gauge theory, which in some interactions, they break uh, parity in the UV, but if they flow to a free Dirac permanent in the infrared, this is a parity invariant theory. So let me now discuss uh, or quickly uh, present a few generalizations uh, of, this, of this story that have been, um, that have been uh, worked out in the literature. So one class of generalization comes from a standard procedure that we can apply uh, every time that we have some theory with a global symmetry. So what we can do is to take part of this symmetry and make it, gauge it and make it dynamical, uh, at least as long as there are no Toft anomalies. And in particular, if we take a duality with two theories and we do the same procedure on the two sides, well, we should obtain a new duality after this procedure. Of course, uh, assuming that this gauging that we have to do in the UV is not driven the RG flow somewhere else. And so, uh, in particular, um, for instance, we can take the duality with orthogonal gauge groups that I presented before, and then we can gauge uh, either uh, charge conjugation symmetry or the magnetic symmetry or both. And in this way, we can obtain dualities for gauge theories that contains groups O, spin, or pin. In fact, we can apply this procedure to all the theories in, uh, uh, that appear in this, in this list of dualities. And as we do that, we can obtain intricate nets of new dualities. And uh, as long as these new proposed dualities are consistent, well, we uh, build up confidence that probably these, these dualities are correct. In fact, using the, the same procedure, we can also produce uh, examples of dualities that involve quiver gauge theories. And so let me just give you one example that was proposed in the literature. So we can take uh, the abelian theory U1 at some level, with n fermions, and we can apply the bosonization duality to each of these fermions, and in this way, we can produce a dual, which is a, a quiver, a linear quiver. And in this case, there, is, uh, there are uh, bifundamental scalar fields in, the, in this quiver. In fact, this procedure is very similar to what we do in uh, abelian mirror symmetry uh, of uh, supersymmetric theories. Now, there is something to keep in mind here, that if the symmetry of the theory is not large, it might be uh, not so easy to precisely identify what are the interactions for scalar fields. Uh, and so, uh, well, in this example, in fact, this is uh, one of the things that we, we should keep in mind. Another class of generalizations uh, involves theories in which we have both scalars and fermions on both sides of the dualities. And so here is one example. Uh, so in these dualities, we have both uh, we have some number of scalars and some number of fermions on both sides, and this number of change uh, in the duality uh, at the same time as rank and 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 uh, Chen level are exchanged. And again, these dualities are uh, proposed or conjectured to be true for these numbers uh, both less than a bound. Now, uh, once again, we can try to study what are the phases of these theories as we 
tune relevant deformations in the UV, in particular relevant deformations that are compatible with all the symmetries, but it turns out that in these theories there are two relevant deformations compatible with all the symmetries, and these are a mass term for the scalars and a mass term for the fermions. And in fact, in this way, we can try to study a two-dimensional phase diagram in which uh, we change these two masses. So once again, it's relatively simple to study this phase diagram in the semi-classical regime in which these masses are large compared to the scale, uh, scales in the problem, in the theories. And what we find are various gap phases separated by gapless lines, like here. And we can compare these phases and lines between the two theories, and they match uh, either because of Leverland dualities or using some of the previously um, proposed dualities. Now, of course, it's a much harder question to ask what happens in the quantum region close to the origin. Um, so in particular, there could be a multicritical fixed point here. There could be some more intricate structure uh, that these uh, gapless lines form. And well, this is a quite hard um, question to, to answer. And we don't know what, what the answer is. Finally, let me mention a generalization that, in fact, was proposed by Minwala at this conference last year. And this is a generalization of the large N vector models in which we do an extra tuning. So in particular, in the scalar theories, we can tune also the quartic interaction of the scalars to zero, uh, as well as the mass term. And on the fermionic side, we can tune uh, four Fermi interactions in such a way to hit a gross neve fixed point. And in fact, this can be done at large n in a precise way. And uh, while well, these authors um, in our work up here have been able to show that, in fact, there are multicritical fixed points at large n, at least at large n. OK. So as I stressed uh, throughout my, my talk so far, so these are conjecture dualities. We cannot prove them. Uh, however, we can test them. And so I would like to quickly uh, mention some of the tests that have been done in the literature. So first of all, we can try to go to large N and K and do computations there, and I already discussed that. Another thing we can do is to uh, make relevant deformations of these theories. Uh, for instance, we can give mass to a single scalar or a single fermion in these theories try to follow the RG flow and see whether this generates uh, a consistent picture, in particular if we generate some new duality that makes sense, or a duality that was already in the list. And in fact, usually we obtain a duality which is already in the list. And once again, as long as the picture is consistent, we, we build up confidence that, uh, that, that these this dualities are probably correct. Along similar lines, we can try to start from some of the supersymmetric dualities that uh, have been studied over the years. And of course, we have a lot of confidence in these dualities because with supersymmetry, there are a lot of quantitative, but impressive checks that we can do on them. And then try to do some relevant deformation, giving mass to some of the fields in such a way to flow to some of the uh, non-supersymmetric dualities. And uh, well, this can be done uh, in a very precise way, a large n, in the sense that we can precisely follow the RG flow. And in fact, this works. It is more difficult to do that at finite n, because it's more difficult to precisely follow the RG flow. But in fact, arguments have been given that even for the smallest values of n and k, this does work. Now, another check that we can do is to compute Toft anomalies in these theories and, match, and, and check that they match across the duality. And I will discuss that in the next slide. We can also try to embed some of these dualities into string theory. And in fact, various, uh, proposed, uh, uh, various uh, setups have been proposed, even with, uh, either with some brain construction or by embedding some of these dualities into ADS-CFT. And finally, uh, something that probably would be one of the most convincing checks of these dualities uh, would be to run lattice Monte Carlo simulations and check the correlation functions at large instances, in fact, agree. Now, uh, there is uh, quite a big literature about uh, the study with lattice Monte Carlo um, um, numerical methods of the parity invariant 
theories without chance sums interactions, but unfortunately there is not so much for the theories with the break part, in particular the theories with chance sums interactions that are relevant for the dualities. However, apparently work is underway, so hopefully very soon we will have some results. Uh, let me just mention that we could also think about applying the Forman Sepson expansion to find some uh, confirmations. But once again, this has been done for the parity invariant theories, uh, but I think there is nothing for the parity broken, uh, for the parity breaking theories. Okay, so what about anomalies? So let me remind you that. Um, Every time that we have a theory with some internal symmetry G, a very useful uh, thing to do is to couple this, global, this uh, theory, and in particular the global symmetry, to background gauge fields for the global symmetry G. And this is uh, useful to do because this produces observables. So in particular, uh, well, for example, the various uh, Euclidean partition functions on uh, compact manifolds that we can define um, for the theory coupled to, to background gauge fields. Now, in fact, it might be impossible for any choice of local counter terms for these background gauge fields to make the partition function a well-defined or gauge invariant function of G bundles. And when this is the case, we say that in the theory there is a Toft anomaly. So what do we do? Well, one way, up to some uh, technical caveats, uh, one way to solve this problem is to uh, extend the space-time manifold in one dimension more, so we can construct a four-manifold whose boundary is the space entry manifold we started with, and then extend the gauge fields, the background gauge fields, uh, the, in, the, in the bulk, in the higher dimension, and then define the partition function as a function of the extended gauge fields. Now, of course, when we do that, this new partition function does depend on the extension. Of course, if, the, if it did not, then well, we, we, we wouldn't have a Toft anomaly to begin with. And so, in particular, we can, um, well, in particular, this dependence on extra data on the extension is precisely the manifestation of the Toft anomaly, and so we can quantify the Toft anomaly by the dependence of this partition function on the extension. And how do we do that? Well, there is a standard trick or a standard procedure that we can do. So if we want to compare two different extensions, what we do is that we take one of the two extensions, we uh, perform a parity uh, inversion, and we can glue the two, and in this way we can obtain a compact form manifold. And so, um, well, the, the difference between the two, the two actions of the ratio of the two partition functions is given by the partition function of uh, a classical topological field theory, which is, uh, in fact, an integral of the background gauge fields on this four manifold. And this is nothing else than the anomaly inflow, the standard anomaly inflow argument. Now, the interesting thing uh, thing uh, here is that, uh, in fact, in this extension, we only extend the background gauge fields, but of course, these are classical gauge fields, so they are inert uh, under the RG flow, and because of the reason, Toft anomalies are uh, independent of the RG flow, and so in particular, this means that we can compute them in the UV, and this gives us an exact evaluation in the infrared. And so in this sense, these are one example of quantities that we can exactly compute in the infrared. So let me give you one example, just one simple example. So uh, suppose we want to study the theory SU2 at level k with an f-complex scalars. Now because SU2 has pseudo real representations, it turns out that the global symmetry in this theory is USP to an f mod Z2, the symmetry acts on the scalars. Now when we turn on background gauge fields for this global symmetry, the scalar fields are coupled both to dynamical gauge fields and to uh, background gauge fields. And in particular, we should specify chan counter counterterms for these gauge fields, uh, as, as, as we do here. Now, as we know, chan counter counterterms uh, need to be quantized to be well-defined. And in this particular example, it turns out that if we take k odd and an f even, there is no solution to these quantization conditions. And in particular, so this means that there is a Toft anomaly. 
Now, in this particular example, in fact, one can quantify uh, the anomaly. In particular, one can quantify the dependence on uh, the extension uh, of the bundles in terms of the Pontryagin square of the um, second stephanometry class of uh, uh, this global symmetry bundle. And it turns out that the uh, uh, dependence on the extension in this case is just a, uh, a sign. So we can do a similar thing, in fact, for all the dualities that I listed. And in particular, we can compute uh, Toft anomalies in these theories, and we can check that they match. And this is a nice uh, check on the, on the dualities. OK, so, um, so once we have built up confidence uh, in these dualities, what we can do is, well, we can try to push them a little bit farther and see whether, in fact, we can draw uh, some other uh, interesting suggestions, where we can see whether they suggest some other interesting phenomena um, in, in, in some of these theories. So I would like to uh, mention two examples. So uh, the first example um, is the fact that dualities suggest uh, the presence of quantum phases with spontaneous symmetry breaking in three-dimensional QCD for the number of flavors in a certain range. So in particular, as I mentioned before, the dualities were originally proposed for the number of, of uh, matter fields that is less than a bound. And so now I would like to see uh, what happens if we try to push uh, this number of, uh, of, uh, of matter fields beyond the bound which in this case is, is 2K. So let's consider a specific example. So let's consider SUN level K with an F complex fermions. So, well, uh, in order to understand the phases of these theories, we can try to see what happens as we change the mass of the fermions. And uh, as we said before, it is simple to see what happens in the semi-classical regime in which these masses are large. So in particular, uh, integrating out the fermions, we obtain for either sign a gapped theory. And in these gapped, in gapped phases, uh, there is some topological sector. However, let's try to see what happens if we consider the, the dual theory, the proposed dual theory. So the proposed dual theory is a gauge theory with unitary gauge group. It's a number of scalar fields, but in particular, the number of scalar fields is larger than the rank of the gauge group. So in particular, if we go in a regime in which the square mass is negative, scalar fields condense, and they spontaneously break the global symmetry, leading to a nonlinear sigma model of Goldstone bosons. So apparently here we have a, a clash comparing the, the phases of the two theories. But in fact, if we really trust, uh, if we want to try to trust these dualities, they suggest something very interesting, which is that in fact, the Fermionic theory does not have just one, but in fact it has two phase transition here. And this phase transition, outside the two phase transition, there are the semi-classical phases that we um, see with the semi-classical analysis. But in the middle, they contain uh, a quantum phase with spontaneous symmetry breaking. Quantum phase in the sense that this phase is not classically or semi-classically visible in the fermionic description, but in fact is semi-classically visible in this uh, uh, dual uh, scalar description. Now, while if this picture is true, of course, this dual description cannot be valid for a full range of masses. It can only be valid around this uh, uh, phase transition because it does not reproduce these phases, but that is OK. Uh, and in fact, one can propose a different dual description which is valid around the other uh, conjectural uh, phase transition point. And, uh, well, as, a, as an obvious check, in fact, the two descriptions predict the same, the very same quantum phase in the middle. So the picture which is suggested by uh, applying these dualities is that, in fact, the phase diagram looks uh, like, uh, like here. Now, uh, once again, there are various checks that one can do, and one is that, in fact, anomalies match. And anomalies are reproduced in the uh, broken phase by a best domino term in the nonlinear sigma model. Uh, it's interesting to consider as a special case the parity invariant case in which uh, the Chen level is zero. And in fact, in this case, this is 
precisely a proposal that was made by Waffen Witten long ago. On the other hand, we know that uh, this picture cannot be true for arbitrarily large values of an f. Uh, this was understood uh, uh, long ago. In fact, that uh, when an f is sufficiently large, we know that there is a second order uh, phase transition and only one phase transition. Um, some interesting arguments have also been given more recently using the F theorem. Uh, and so, uh, in this sense, there is an upper bound on the number of flavors for which uh, this uh, behavior conjecturally happens, but we don't know exactly what this bound is. Um, but on the other hand, there are some numerical evidences of this, at least in the case of SU2 level 0. This evidence comes from lattice Monte Carlo simulations, and uh, in particular, uh, they are able to see that, for instance, with two flavors, uh, we do see spontaneous symmetry breaking, and when the number of flavors is sufficiently large, I think larger uh, or equal to eight, uh, there is no um, symmetry breaking. And it's not clear what happens in the middle. We can also get uh, more confirmations uh, of, this, of this picture by um, realizing the three-dimensional theories as domain wo volume theories on domain walls in four dimensions. So this is a very interesting way of relating three-dimensional physics to four-dimensional physics. And in particular, Gaiotto, Kapustin, Komalgoski, and Skyberg looked at what happens in uh, standard QCD, so SUN, four-dimensional SUN QCD, with a number of flavors which is below the conformal window, and in particular, one can ask what happens as we change the complex mass of the quarks. Now, it is believed that for all complex values of the mass of the quarks, the, uh, the theory is confined and there is a single gap vacuum. But along uh, the negative real axis, in fact, along the real axis, uh, the theory has a CP invariance. But on the other hand, it is believed that along the negative real axis, CP is spontaneously broken, and this gives rise to two degenerate vacua. And in fact, these authors gave very convincing uh, um, arguments in favor of this, based on uh, the analysis of uh, anomalies. Now, so let's stay along this line. Then, since there are two vacua, there is a domain wall, a three-dimensional domain wall, that connects them, and we can ask, what is the theory that lives on this domain wall? In particular, we can ask what is the theory that lives on them as we change the value of the quark mass along this line. Now, when the quark mass is very large, they are essentially in young males, and then one can argue that the work volume theory on the domain walls is uh, uh, SUN, uh, well, the, the theory is gapped and, and contains a topological sector. For instance, one can use the analysis of Achari and Bafa in super QCD and then uh, integrating out uh, uh, the Gagini. On the other hand, one can analyze these domain walls for very small values of the mass. In this case, one can analyze them with the chiral Lagrangian, which is essentially a dual description of the physics there. And then one finds that in this regime, the domain walls break spontaneously uh, the symmetry, and so the world volume theory is a nonlinear sigma model. So since we obtain two different phases, there must be some phase transition in the middle. This phase transition should happen for some value of the quark mass, where in the bulk nothing happens, but on the world volume theory, um, well, there is a phase transition. And in fact, one can give arguments, and well, one can argue that the theory uh, on the domain walls should be precisely the theory that we discussed before, at least for some uh, particular choice of the, of the parameters. Uh, and in fact, these two phases that one obtains from a fundamental analysis, well, one of them corresponds to one of the semi-classical phases, but the other one corresponds to the, to the uh, proposed quantum phase. Now, the second example is, uh, regards application of very similar ideas and arguments, a theory where now we have fermions not in the fundamental but in the adjoint representation. So for concrete, let's consider SUN level K with an adjoint fermion. Now for a suitable value of the fermion mass, this theory is supersymmetric. And so in fact, these arguments can shed new light on the understanding of supersymmetry breaking in, this in, this, in these theories. Now it was known since the work of Witten that if the level is sufficiently large, in particular it's larger than N, uh, larger or equal to n, then supersymmetry is not broken, because the Witten index is different from zero. 
But if k is small, then with an index is zero, one expects supersymmetry breaking with a massless Gostino. Now the question is, well, what is the full theory at this supersymmetry breaking point? And one can try to answer this question with very similar techniques. So one can study what happens as we vary the mass of the fermion away from the supersymmetry uh, breaking point. And uh, well, semi-classically, one finds two gut phases with some topological sector. But in fact, it was proposed uh, by these authors that there should be not just one, but two phase transitions in this theory. In particular, they propose dual descriptions for the, that are valid around this phase transition. And in the middle, there should be a quantum phase. This quantum phase is not semi-classically visible in this original description, but it is semi-classically visible in these descriptions. And well, in this time, this uh, quantum phase is gapped. It is some topological sector. However, as I said, it's something that is not, uh, is not visible semi-classically. So the conclusion is that at the supersymmetry breaking point, we have a massless Gostino plus some topological theory, which we cannot easily recognize, uh, semi-classically recognize from the original uh, Lagrangian description. OK. So let me conclude with some uh, remarks. So, um, well, we've learned a lot over the years, and we're still learning a lot about dualities and many non-perturbative phenomena in supersymmetric quantum field theories. And of course, this is because in the case of supersymmetry, there are so many quantities that we can compute exactly. So either we can uh, prove non-perturbative phenomena, or when we conjecture them, usually we can um, make them to a test and uh, perform very sophisticated and quantitative checks of those. And well, there is no doubt that in the formulation of these non-supersymmetric non dualities, um, a big role was played by the, uh, all the, the knowledge and the experience that we developed by, the, by studying supersymmetric theories. So at least for me, it's quite uh, satisfactory to see that all these lessons that we learned and the experience that we built up in the study of supersymmetric theories can also be used to uh, make non-trivial predictions about uh, um, the dynamics of, of, of non-supersymmetric theories. Well, then, if, if this is true, it's natural to, uh, it's a natural thing to, to try to do, to consider the many different directions that have been pursued and that are being pursued in the study of supersymmetric theories and see whether something similar can be done. Uh, with our supersymmetry. Uh, just to make one example, one could ask, yeah, just one second. <laughs> one could ask, um, for instance, about boundary conditions and how they are mapped across the dualities. And in fact, this is a problem that has already been started, uh, but more generally, one could study what happens to more general defects. Uh, I'm also looking forward to very uh, intense interactions of these ideas with various non-perturbative methods, in particular with the conformal bootstrap, as this might uh, uh, very likely lead to very interesting uh, progress. And, uh, well, at least to me, it is uh, amusing the possibility that some of these ideas might be experimentally tested in some on this matter uh, system um, precisely designed to engineer some of these theories, I think this, that uh, this would be uh, very spectacular. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Francesco. Questions? Questions? Most of the examples you discuss at Martin in the fundamental representation, are there any duality? Why is this the case? Are there any known cases where you have, say, Martin via join or some other representation? Yes, yes. There are, uh, so essentially, those are the examples that have been worked out first. But in fact, other examples have been worked out. In particular, you can go to rank two, a tensor representation, a joint symmetric and antisymmetric. Uh, some cases have been analyzed and uh, understood. Uh, not all of them, but of course, more generally, you could ask about generic meta representations. Of course, in three dimensions, all these theories go to strong coupling. And so, of course, a very interesting question to ask what happens in general. Um, so, there is absolutely a lot of 
work to do and a lot to understand um, in, this, in this framework. This is more of a comment, so it's, it's related to this idea of experimentally testing. So another thing you could do is you uh, could try testing these dualities on a quantum computer. So as long as, I mean, we don't have them yet, but you know, on a five, 10 year time scale, uh, there's no sign problem for a quantum computer. So one could just uh, you know, study, compute the, you know, simulate both of the actions and look at the correlation functions and see if they match. So uh, yeah, it, it seems like a question. So by that you mean to actually yeah, to well, really com compute the patin integral if you want, or compute yeah, yeah, the correlation you function. You simulate the Hamiltonian. It's a Hamiltonian system, and you can uh, look at the correlation functions, uh, and they agree or they don't. I mean, you know, okay, the anomalies match. You know, maybe you know it's evidence, but you don't really know, right? But if if you see the correlation functions, you know, for some generic things agreeing, it's definitely correct. So. Hopefully, this will be possible soon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think so. Any other questions? not let's thank francesco again so the next speaker is Nati Seiberg, not mine. He's and my he'll talk about QED3. Yeah, except it's my laptop. It's done. Oh. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much. I'd like to join the previous speaker and all the future speakers in thanking the organizers for putting together such a wonderful conference and for inviting me to speak here. My topic is QED3, and I'm following on the beautiful review that Francesco Benini has just given. And later in this, uh, conference that the next talk will be by Zohar Komagotsky, who will also talk about related topics. So what I will do here is just focus on one particular example. He had a long list of many examples, but I'll discuss just a particular example and demonstrate some of the general phenomena that he mentioned. And the talk is going to have, oops, the talk is going to have two parts following the general recipe of thinking about quantum field theory. So when we study quantum field theory, there'll be two kinds of things that we could do. One of them is more reliable and more explicit, and the other is more conjectural. And correspondingly, the talk is going to have two parts. The first will be semi-classical. We'll analyze the theory in the UV. This should be straightforward. There is no excuse not to get it right. Although, as you will see, it could be extremely subtle, rich, and interesting. So this will be the first part of the talk. And in the second part of the talk, we'll see where quantum field theory is really fun, where we go to the infrared, and we, the theory is very, very quantum mechanical, and the quantum mechanical theory could do all sorts of surprising things, but here we'll not be able to prove things, we'll have conjectures. So the first part of the, the first part of the talk will be more solid, and you will see that it feels subtle, and the second part, something wrong with this. And the second part will be, is this better? And the second part will be more conjectural, but correspondingly it will be much more interesting uh, because we'll see surprising phenomena. So what are we talking about? We're talking about QED3. This is a three-dimensional version of the well-studied QED4. And there's huge literature on the subject, so I decided not to give references here. People studied it over the years with many, many techniques. And the reason we study this theory is there are several reasons. First of all, it's very simple. 
the gauge group is a billion, so of all the theories in three dimensions, this is probably the one to start with. And even though it's simple, it turns out to be somewhat characteristic, and it exhibits, in the sense that it exhibits many different phenomena, very rich structure of a phase space of phenomena, and you will see that. And many of these phenomena were later seen also in more complicated examples. So these are these surpri the surprising phenomena. And it has many applications, including in condensed matter physics, and we've heard a little bit about it in the earlier talk. So what's the cast of characters? The cast of characters is a U1 gauge field, A mu. This, for, till the end of this talk, we'll have only a billion gauge fields. We don't have to think about non-abelian groups. And we have some fermions, psi i, with charges qi and masses mi. So we are going to explore the theory as a function of the number of flavors, the charges, and we are going to dial the masses. And there is a bare churn simons term that we can add. So this is an integer freedom. We can change an integer k. But the, label will, the way we will label the theory is not by an integer value k, but something that would be integer or half integer, which is a subscript k here, u1 sub k. And one way to think about it is to give masses to all the fermions. If we give all the fermions a large mass, we can integrate them out. And then at low energies, all we end up with is the same photon, but it has some induced churn simons term. And the churn simons term at low energies depends on the parameter k and the contribution from the fermions. And this is the expression. It depends on the sign of the mass. And what this means is that depending on the charges in the problem, the parameter k could be integer or half integer. And we'll see soon that this has dramatic consequences. The first thing in analyzing a quantum field theory, so this is kind of a recipe. When you're given a quantum field theory, the first thing to analyze is the global symmetry. So what are the global symmetries? First, we have charge conjugation. We flip the sign of a mu with some ob obvious action on the fermions. If the level of the churn simons here is zero and the mass is zero, we have time reversal. So a zero goes to that and a i goes to that. They have opposite signs. And we can combine c and t, and then the sign will move from here to here. And they satisfy this standard algebra that everybody knows and loves. And you will soon see how this algebra starts falling apart. But at least at this level, this is a correct statement. Also, we might have internal symmetries, symmetries that commute with the Lorentz group. For example, if all the fermions have equal charges and they have equal mass, we can rotate among them and we have such a global symmetry. So all this is as we know in four dimensions. This is very simple. But in three dimensions, there is a new thing that happens. And most of the fun in this story come from that. So J mu is a conserved current. It's trivially conserved. And its charges are quantized. And the charge objects are monopole operators. And they are defined by removing a point from space time and specifying boundary conditions, or the flux, around that point. And this is very much like what people in the early days in condensed matter physics used to call a disorder operator. So this is a disorder operator. And I would like to emphasize that it should be thought on equal footing as the operators we construct by polynomials of the fundamental field. We can't say we prefer the operators that are constructed out of the fundamental field and ignore the monopole operators. That's not even an invariant statement under duality. It's like saying that in the Ising model, we like to study the order parameter, but not the disorder parameter, the disorder operator. And the reason this become, will become fun is that when we have massless fermions, this construction has fermion zero modes. And when we quantize the fermion zero modes, they can lead to funny quantum numbers. So a lot of the fun in the story will come from this funny in a quotation marks. Now, as we discuss this magnetic symmetry, we should keep in mind the application. And in many of the applications, this magnetic symmetry is either absent or is broken to a subgroup. And I listed here some of the applications, for example, in lattice constructions, or when the U1 is embedded, say, in SU2 at shorter distances, or when the U1 is an emergent symmetry. And in various generalizations, like if instead of we think of the U1 as SO2, and we generalize the index here from 2 to n with higher n, then the magnetic symmetry is only Z2. So for all of these reasons, we would like to broaden our horizon a little bit. And think about this theory QED with another parameter we can turn on. And we'll turn it on with a small coefficient. This is a monopole operator. We are allowed to put in the Lagrangian a monopole operator. The theory is now no longer renormalizable. 
but it would still be a very good effective description of a more microscopic theory. And we would like to see how the dynamics changes as we turn on this uh, monopole up in the Lagrangian. So let me go through examples. I'm going to list four examples. First, we'll go through all these examples in the reliable part of the talk. And then we'll go through the same four examples in the unreliable part of it. So the first example would be one fermion with charge one. This is the simplest theory to start with. This is, some people will call that QED, and the others are generalizations of QED. So K is an integer plus a half. And since it cannot vanish, time reversal must be violated. And this is known in the, physics, in the high energy physics literature as the parity anomaly. And we try to construct operators, so we write polynomials in the fundamental fields and their derivatives. It must have equal number of fermions with charge one and fermions with charge minus one, and therefore all the operators in the spectrum are necessarily boson. So we, all the operators are boson. We can also study monopole operators for a procedure I mentioned before. They also turn out to be bosons. For the U1 level a half, the simplest monopole operator has spin zero. And for the U1 level 3 half, the simplest monopole operator has spin 1. I emphasize again, this is straightforward semi-classical co computation. There is no room for mistake here. So we'll have to remember this 0 here and 1 here, because it will play a crucial role later in the The second example is NF equals 2. The previous example was always time reversal violating. We are more interested in theories that are time reversal invariant. So either we should change the number of fermions, or we should change the electric charge of the fermion to make it time reversal invariant. So the first thing is to study the theory with two fermions. And it's very similar to what we said before. Now we can set this thing to zero. So all the gauge invariant polynomials are bosons. And furthermore, since they have equal number of size, the psi bars, for that matter, just even number of fermions, they must be bosons with integer isospin. The global SU2 is the isospin. I'll refer to it as flavor or isospin. For the monopole operators, we find more, more interesting charges. And again, this is semi-classical computation. Here we can have half integer isospin. So monopole number one is an operator in the spin isospin a half. It's still a boson, but it's isospin a half. Monopole number two is an integer charge. Monopole number three can have half integer charges. And we have time reversal, but here we have a surprise. So this is straightforward computation, but you have to be very careful. It turns out that T square on these monopoles, the monopole charge one, is minus one. So T square and C T square, which are normally minus one to the F, and since these are bosons, we should have plus one. Here we find minus one. So even though charge conjugation and time reversal act in the standard old-fashioned way on all the fundamental fields in the Lagrangian, and therefore, they act in a standard way on all polynomials in the fundamental fields. We can multiply fermions, gauge fields, derivatives. They act in a non-trivial way, in a non-standard way, on the monopoles. We'll see this, this thing will come again and again. It turns out to be a ubiquitous phenomenon that, personally, I was shocked to, to learn that. That we do kind of, we just follow the, our nose, we do what we're supposed to do, and we have such a surprising result. And I'd like to point you to Poshen Shin's poster in the poster session that will give more details about the number. That's another way to modify the story. We said that we wanted a theory with zero charge, zero level here, so that it's time reversal invariant. So instead of having two fermions, we can stay with one fermion, as in the basic QED, but just declare that the charge of the fermion is two rather than one. So in perturbation theory, it makes no difference. The fermion has charge one, charge zero, we just draw the same diagrams. But non-perturbatively, there's a completely different theories. And in particular, we can set the level here to be zero in a consistent way. And therefore, this theory is time reversal invariant. So we do the same thing. All the operators that we construct just by multiplying fermions together in derivatives are bosons. And when we go to the monopoles, they can have fractional spin. They can have spin a half. So all the fundamental fields have are bosons, but the fermions could be bosons or fermions. And minus 1 to m, the monopole number is minus 1 to the f. So in the previous example, we had fractional isospin, and here we have fractional spin. And we still have our friend time reversal, and p square is minus 1 to the f. 
So, so far, nothing surprising. But recall that we would like to turn on a monopole operator, add it to the Lagrangian. Before I do that, let me just remind you of one more thing that we'll come, we'll come to later. The basic monopole operator is a fermion. This will be soon very important. So we would like to turn on a monopole operator. You see it has charge A. The basic monopole is a fermion, so we cannot add it to the Lagrangian. So instead, we'll add to the Lagrangian a double monopole operator. So we're not going to add M, but M square. As we do that, the magnetic symmetry is explicitly broken to Z2. Well, that's the reason we did that. We wanted to break the symmetry. And the time reversal symmetry is also explicitly broken by the deformation. This sounds kind of counterproductive because we wanted to study these theories which have level zero, such that the system is time reversal invariant. But by doing this deformation, we broke the time reversal symmetry. However, a subgroup of this and that, so originally we had this symmetry and that symmetry, that this is broken and this is broken, but the combination of them remains unbroken. So this is a combination of time reversal and something that depends on the magnetic charge. So this factor is broken and this factor is broken. In this system, this transformation is as time reversal as anything else because it flips the direction of time. It's an anti-unitary transformation, and it works on the fundamental fields. It acts on the fundamental fields the same way as T because this thing doesn't act on the fundamental field. So this is a good time, time reversal symmetry to study. And it turns out to satisfy a very, very peculiar algebra, which follows just from the standard algebra that T and M satisfy the ordinary commutation relations. We find this algebra. The time this time reversal does not commute with C. It commutes with C on all the fundamental fields, but it does not commute with C on monopoles. And although C T square is minus 1 to the f, standard result, T square is 1 and not minus 1 to the f. So this system, which is a very natural system to study, has this peculiar global symmetry. And again, I emphasize I'm in the reliable part of the talk, where uh, everything follows from semi-classical. So the questions we would like to analyze is what happens at short distances. So I'm kind of gradually moving toward the unreliable part of the talk where we discuss the extreme infrared, but now we know a lot of stuff about the UV physics, a lot of stuff that will guide us toward finding the right answer. So we ask ourselves all these questions, and when the mass is large, we know what to do. In fact, we've already said we're going to get a topological field theory with some level here, and another topological field theory at some level here. Given that these two levels are different, there must be a phase transition in between, and in the rest of the talk, I'll try to fill in this blob with the question mark. So here is my wording sign. Now we are really stepping into this dangerous territory of conjectures, but I'm quite confident that at least some of them are. So we have some guidance from various limits, which are semi-classical limits that we can analyze, large k or large number of flavors. In this case, we know that there must be a second order transition between negative mass and positive mass is a single first order, a single second order transition here. So it will not be too outrageous to argue that this is always true. So we are going to assume that in all these theories, we have two phases with a single phase second order transition in between. So now I'm going to go through the various examples as I studied before. Take this as an assumption, and I'm going to give more details about this particular second order transition. So it will not be a random second order transition. It will be a very interesting one, which has some interesting features. So first, we study this basic QED, one fermion with one, one fermion with charge one, the function of k. And fortunately for me, I can be very quick here, because Francesco did just such a wonderful job reviewing it. So I'll be very brief. Uh, this system has a monopole operator, which has spin zero. We identify it with the order parameter of the O2 model. So the conjecture is that this flows to the O2 Wilson facial fixed point. And it has an emergent time reversal symmetry in the infrared. This system I emphasize is not time reversal invariant, but the infrared behavior is time reversal invariant. The second example was U1 level 3 halves, and we conjecture that it also flows to a fixed point, a fixed point that has a global SO3 symmetry. So here we have already mentioned that the monopole operator that we see semi-classically has spin 1, and we say this spin 1 operator, which has very high dimension and is very complicated, 
its dimension goes down as we go to the infrared, and it joins the O2 to make an SO3. Well, we have seen that before many times. We've seen that in the compact boson in two dimensions, where at a special radius, the winding operator comes down in dimension and joins the standard current to form an SU2. So here, the same thing. Short distances, we see O2, and it's enhanced to SO3. We have seen similar phenomena in supersymmetric theories, especially in the context in three dimensions, especially in the context of three-dimensional mirror symmetry. Again, the Cartan subalgebra is visible, is visible in the UV, but by the time we are in the infrared, we find a non-abelian global symmetry. And here we see it without supersymmetry in three dimensions. So that's a new thing. And also, this theory has a whole bunch of fermionic and bosonic dual descriptions that you can read more about it in these papers. Moving to our next examples, examples that preserve time reversal symmetry. So this is a summary of what we had in the reliable part of the talk. So this was analyzed by various authors. So microscopically, we have U2 and charge conjugation and time reversal symmetry. And T and CT have this non-standard algebra. So what happens at long distances? So here we also have a conjecture. The conjecture is that this system has an O4 global symmetry. So short distances we have U2, it is enhanced to O4. And furthermore, it has a dual fermionic description, which looks very much like the original microscopic theory, U1 level 0 with two fermions. But the SU2 flavor symmetry in this theory is not the SU2 that we see in the original one. The magnetic symmetry of the original description is a third component of isospin of the dual and vice versa. So we have two descriptions, and the O4 has two SU2s. Each description does justice to one SU2, but does not do justice to the other SU2. But together, we see the full picture. We move to the last example. Uh, I think it's the last. So we have U1 level 0. Uh, sorry, it's still the same example. We, sorry. Still the same example. Now we do what we're instructed to do. We have this theory. We try to break the magnetic symmetry by adding a monopole operator to the Lagrangian. And that explicitly breaks the flavor SU2 to U1. And it breaks the magnetic symmetry to Z2. That's the reason we do that, because we want to break the magnetic symmetry. And using all our assumed duality and all these properties that we learn, the system really has three phases. So before we had one phase transition with O4 symmetry. Now we can follow the symmetries. And the phase transition splits to two phase transitions. And our discussion tells us that these two phase transition points are the O2 Wilson Fisher fixed point. So we have a gap trivial phase here, the Goldstone boson here, and another gap trivial phase in here. This phase with the Goldstone boson is extremely surprising and extremely interesting. It is surprising because the short distance theory is massive. We have QED with masses and some monopole up. And yet, the long distance physics is massless. This, you might find this impossible, but we should remember that the masses are small. The masses are of order h bar, and therefore it's not outrageously. I saw David kind of almost jumping out of his seat. How can that be? But if the mass is order h bar, is more relaxed. It's still surprising that we can actually say that. Admittedly, not with confidence. This is a conjecture, but I'm pretty sure the conjecture is right because it fits nicely. This brings me to the last example of a single fermion with charge two. And some old-fashioned people will say charge one, charge two, who cares? But it makes a huge difference. In perturbation theory, it makes no difference. And specifically, we can put the label here to be zero that we could not do when the charge was one. So, we discussed this theory before. And recall that the monopole operator was a spinner. So all the, polynom all the operators constructed out of polynomials of the fundamental fields are bosons. But the monopole operator was a spinner. And the key thing about duality is always go after the monopole. Because the monopole is the one that will give you fun in the infrared. And we've seen that before, and we see the same thing again here. So the claim is that this theory becomes at long distances a free Dirac fermion in a decoupled topological field. This is a very dramatic statement because this theory is a lot like ordinary QED. The only difference is that the charge is two instead of one. 
something that old-fashioned people would say, oh, there's no difference. But the answer is different. In one case, the infrared behavior is the O2 Wilson Fisher fixed point. And here, the long distance behavior is a single fermion, a single massless fermion at long distances. And I've already said that there was a monopole operator in the UV. It becomes the free fermion in the IR, very similar to the current that we saw before. We see a, mon a monopole operator in the UV, a very complicated object, high dimension. And its dimension goes down until it hits the dimension of a free fermion. And the other surprising thing is this U1 level 2. It showed this is the, more, this is the dynamical fields have electric charge 2. We can ask, what about the Wilson line with charge 1? So charge 18 Wilson line can be screened with the fundamental fermions to 0. But charge 1 Wilson line cannot be screened. So this is a very interesting order parameter. In more modern language, we would say that this operator carries a one-form global symmetry. The infrared person says, Aha, the Wilson line of the U1 level 2 is the thing that carries that one form global symmetry. So we identify the Wilson line charge 1 in the UV with the Wilson line of charge 1 in the infrared. And here we know from standard topological field theory that this is a semion. So this is the second surprising thing about this theory. It started at short distances, U1 with the fermion, and we do this and that. Now we know that in the infrared it has a free fermion and a massive semion. Very, very surprising. I recall this is a conjecture, but I'm quite sure this is right. There's a lot of evidence. This is right. And as we always do, we had to add to the Lagrangian a monopole operator. So here, the monopole operator uh, deforms the symmetry. We've already discussed that deformation in the UV part of the talk. So we have this funny time reversal symmetry with funny algebra. And we had one fixed point with a free Dirac fermion. What this monopole operated deformation does is to split the mass of the Dirac fermion to two Majorana fermions. So the infrared behavior of the theory is our topological field theory that is kind of decoupled at long distances, gapped phases here, here, and here, and two special points with massless Majorana fermion. So this is just a Dirac fermion, and this monopole operator that we add to the Lagrangian splits it to two massless Majoranas that become massless at two Majoranas that become massless at different points. So this is the summary of the talk. Oh, I'm going to find. We studied QED3. I decided to focus in this talk on a particular set of examples out of the rich structure that Francesco reviewed. QED3, it's a U1K gauge theory with some charged fermions. And I emphasize that the talk had two parts because it turns out that some people are confused about these two parts of quantum field theory, the UV, semi-classical, reliable, and the IR, very quantum, which is sometimes more conjectural. So in the reliable part of the talk, we discussed the global symmetry, and we saw that the global symmetry could be subtle and could exhibit funny phenomena, and specifically, there could be charges and funny charges and funny spins, and also unusual algebra, charge conjugation, and time reversal. And the fun is, of course, with the monopoles, the monopole. So that was the reliable part of the talk. The unreliable part of the talk, no, that's too strong. The conjectured part of the talk, we presented some conjectures about the infrared behavior of these systems. And the qualitative new phenomena that were also emphasized in Benini's talk before me, but this doesn't make them less correct that there's an enhanced global symmetry. We saw examples with continuous global symmetry, O2 becoming SO3, and U2 becoming O4. And there are also dual descriptions, different dual theories that flow to the same point. But it should really be emphasized that what I talked about here is a tiny, tiny fraction of a very long and rich story about the behavior of these theories. I focused only on abelian groups, and even there it was only abelian groups with fermion. I did not include any billions group with scalars or non-abelian groups, and we can make it much more complicated. But this is a good warm-up, kind of the first example, and I'm sure that Komagotsky is going to give us more sophisticated examples, but the tools are kind of similar. So A, this is a tiny fraction of a rich story, but B, which is not less important, that most of this rich story is not yet known, so there's a lot more that can be done. Thank you. Thank you.
David. Really beautiful story. Uh, Thank you, you only discussed one and two. Are your results more or less mod two? No. Every integer is a different story. Really? So I hope that. I hope that we'd see some pattern. So I'm doing physics by exploration, do one example after the other. And so far, every example, I find something new. So that's why QE, it's so exciting. Q equals 17 will be fascinating. I don't know if it will be fascinating. I believe that 17 will kind of be somewhere in the large number of flavor regions. There will be some fixed points. There will be nothing special about it. Four already has some new features. And I don't know. I, I feel that I feel that there are many new phenomena here. We don't know what they are. That's the first thing. And the second thing, I don't yet see any way to organize it. I start seeing some pattern. Whenever I think, okay, that's it. The next example doesn't fit the pattern. But that's what makes it fun. There are questions. Uh, I have a question about the enhancement of uh, O2 symmetry to SO3 symmetry. So in one plus one dimension, so uh, compactified free boson at safety radius also has some uh, uh, symmetry, enhancement of enhancement symmetry from U1 current algebra to SU2 current algebra. So is it related to that? Yes, it's very related because in, what, in both cases, the operator that enhances the symmetry is something that is topological. Right? There was a U1, which was a current, and the operator that extends it is something that carries momentum, or winding, and that means that it's an operator that semi-classically is very high dimension and comes down. It's kind of topological. In that sense, it is similar. There's a much more similar example in three dimensions in the context of mirror symmetry, but that's true in supersymmetric three-dimensional theories. There, there's a billion symmetry that you see with the naked eye, which ends up being the Cartan subgroup, the final symmetry. And there are various monopole operators, which start their lives as high-dimension operators, but by the time we're in the infrared, they fill in the rest of the roots of the non-abelian group. There's a stringy version of the same phenomenon where various brains wrap cycles, and it, as the cycles shrink, they, we get the non-abelian symmetry. So the stringy version of it is very similar to what we see here and in the field theory with supersymmetry. The, the stringy version also relies heavily on having this BPS notion. It gives us more control about what's going on. Here, we don't have anything. B, the, the, the word BPS, the, these, these are three letters, did not appear in my talk because there was no supersymmetry. Yet, we see very similar phenomena. And as Francesco said in his talk, it makes me very happy because for years I've been working on supersymmetric theories, learning new and new phenomena in quantum field theory. And I always believed that that this phenomena exists even without supersymmetry, but I couldn't prove it. So here is an explicit manifestation of all these phenomena occurring also without supersymmetry. Thank you. Veronica. One last question, maybe. Veronica, please. Veronica, somewhere. Um, well, I have a very, just a naive conceptual question about this emergent time reversal symmetry. So, I mean, usually we're, we're used to effective theories picking up an arrow of time because you're ignoring the microscopic degrees of freedom and so forth. So, do you have a, a sort of conceptual way of understanding how you gain a time reversal invariance in the effective description in the IR? Well, I can give you the textbook answer. So, it's the same as in the standard model. At low energies, we have time reversal symmetry, CP, even though at short distances, we don't. And the reason is that at low energies, it's hard to write operators that violate that symmetry. Assuming that here, the, at long distances, it's the conjecture that it is the Wilson-Fisher fixed point, and the Wilson-Fisher fixed point has time reversal in the infrared. And then you can ask yourself, 
what is the lowest dimension operator you can turn on that respects the global symmetries but violates time reversal. And that operator has high dimension. This is as conceptual as I can get. Okay, let's thank Nati again. <laughs> we have a coffee break. Thank you.
session. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Zohar Komogorsky. He'll tell us about the vacuum of some two plus one dimensional gauge theories. So. Hey, thanks very much uh, for inviting me to this uh, amazing location and to the organizers for doing such a great work. <clears throat> uh, I'll, it will be extremely hard for me to follow up on uh, the great lectures that were in the morning, but I'll try to do my best. And there will be some little overlap, which I'll go. I'll, maybe I'll repeat some of the things that were already said, but that would not take much time. So I'm going to explain some recent uh, new results about uh, three dimensional gauge theories, namely two plus one dimensional gauge theories. And I'll emphasize uh, some implications for four dimensional gauge theories at the end. And the presentation is mostly based on some works in collaboration with David Agayotto. Uh, Jaume Gomez, and uh, Nathan Seiberg, and some work in progress. Okay, so just a little bit of terminology. There will be three kinds of phases that we'll encounter today. Uh, a trivially gapped phase is just a massive phase of quantum field theory where the ground state wave function is approximately a direct product. There will be phases where there are topological field theories. Where, so in those cases, the wave function is not exactly a, a product. Uh, since there is some entanglement. And then there, is a, there will be also massless phases, genuine massless phases. I'm not going to try to distinguish different types of trivial gap phases. In fact, they're all not, this, not all the same. That would not be important for this talk. So in this talk, my goal is to present a, a conjecture for the long distance behavior, namely the solution of two gauge theories in three dimensions, SUN gauge theory with a Majorana fermion in the adjoint representation. That's the first case. And the second case is uh, QCD uh, in three dimensions, namely SUN gauge theory with an F flavors in the fundamental representation. So I'll refer to these two theories as adjoint QCD and QCD for brevity. And the main, t the main point of this talk would be to present uh, a proposed solution to the long distance behavior of these two theories. Now, these theories have various weakly coupled limits in which we can analyze the dynamics in detail. But in the end, one has no choice but to make some leaps of faith and make some conjectures, subjecting, of course, these conjectures to lots of consistency checks. Now, typically, uh, those who've studied the literature in four dimensions are used to the fact that any such conjecture about the long distance behavior of QCD-like theories, whether or not they are supersymmetric, is substantiated by these amazing uh, tests of Tooft anomalies. That was done in the 80s in QCD, in the 90s for supersymmetric QCD, and so on. And one may be worried that we won't have enough su sufficiently many consistency checks since we're in two plus one dimensions. And it's normally said that there are no two anomalies. But in fact, that's not true. One of the reasons this subject has been recently so active and in many communities is that in fact, there are many two anomalies in two plus one dimensions. They are discrete, but matching uh, a few discrete anomalies, which are defined perhaps mod, mod 16, mod n, is still very non-trivial and constraining. And you'll see some examples. You'll see that the conjecture is by pass extremely non-trivial consistency checks. In particular, there is a time, if, if, a, if a two plus one dimensional theory has a time reversal symmetry, this is very different from three plus one. So if a two plus one dimensional theory has a time reversal symmetry with this algebra, and you can look at the nutty stock for more details, uh, if this algebra is uh, satisfied, there is a mod 16 anomaly for gauging time reversal symmetry. This has been crucial in many developments in condensed matter physics and also in particle physics, in particular what I'll cover today. So to understand the origin of this mod 16 anomaly for time reversal invariant theories, you can look at Witten's uh, paper from 2015, which he also uh, gave a talk about in strings 2015, if I remember right, or perhaps 2016. So matching these anomalies will be non-trivial. So what is the, the Lagrangian of the two theories that we're going to try to solve is just the standard kinetic term, a and simons term, which we can possibly add. In the adjoint case, we have a single fermion, a real fermion in the adjoint representation. In QCD, we have an fermion in the fundamental representation. So nothing mysterious. Then for consistency, one needs to require that the churn simons level is properly quantized, which is, of course, well known. So the convention that I'm using is that these are the correct quantization conditions of the churn simons level. Namely, if n is odd, k has to be a half integer. And if an f is odd, then k also has to be a half integer. 
A very interesting special case is when k vanishes in my conventions, and also the mass of the fermions vanishes. So there was a mass term here in both theories, which preserves all the symmetries other than time reversal symmetry. So when this mass term vanishes, we have time reversal symmetry if k vanishes. So the theory with massless quarks vanishing churn Simon's level has a, a time reversal symmetry. And it's in some sense the best analog of three plus one dimensional QCD. So that's really our end goal to solve this theory. So in addition, adjoint QCD has a center, uh, which does not act on any of the matter fields. So that's uh, called one form symmetry. And that will also be important. We will be uh, careful to match some one form symmetry anomalies. I won't explain the details, but it's just important that you know that this is also in the background. OK, so what are the weakly coupled limits of these theories? The weakly coupled limits were already covered uh, very beautifully by Francesco and Nari. <coughs> So there are two weakly coupled limits in these theories, in which the theory is sort of boring. Dyna I mean, there is no interesting dynamics. One is when the mass is huge, then the quarks just decouple before the interaction set in, or when the churn simons level is huge. In that case, the photon decouples before the interaction set in. So either the fermion or the photon can decouple, or both, before the interaction set in. And then these theories typically have a trivial phase diagram with one fixed point and two massive and two phases with topological field theories on the two sides of the transition, and this uh, and, and these transitions are typically non-Landau Ginzburg because they interpolate between two non-trivial topological field theories. But th these kind of limits are most analogous to the conformal window in QCD. So there is no non-trivial dynamics; there is just some conformal field theory and trivial phases. So here I explain that uh, when k is large, the gauge field decouples. So the physics at large mass is always easy, and the physics at large k is always easy. And when the mass, and, and when k is large, as you vary the mass, you encounter a simple phase transition between two topological filters. And the properties of these phase transitions can be explicitly understood by uh, perturbative expansions if k is sufficiently large. So here is the first phase diagram. Imagine that k is very large, and we're discussing adjoint QCD. So there is a topological field theory here, a topological field theory here with different subscripts. So these are different topological theories and some phase transition, which we know is second order if k is sufficiently large. So there is some conformal field theory that you can just construct in some, something that is a little bit reminiscent of the banks dax expansion. So this is analogous to the conformal phase of uh, Q Q QCD in four dimensions. And there is a very similar phase diagram for QCD. If uh, k is sufficiently large, uh, the theory of SUN gauge theories with an F flavors has a simple phase transition, which we can understand perturbatively. The big question, if you're familiar with four dimensional physics, is where does the conformal window end? This question is still open in four dimensions, but surprisingly, in three dimensions, due to duality and many other these discrete anomalies and many other ideas that I'll explain, we actually have an answer. So for adjoint QCD, we believe that the conf this kind of uh, simple phase diagram ceases to be true for k at n over 2. And for QCD, it ceases to be true at nf over 2. So these are like, in some sense, the analogs of uh, the conformal window, the end of the conformal window uh, in four dimensions. And these are conjectures. But I'll substantiate these conjectures with various arguments, many consistency checks. And I, I, I strongly believe they are true. So here are two initial, so these are two preliminary hints that this uh, conjecture is for the, for the, for the, for the, for, for something interesting happening with these phase diagrams may be true. The first hint is that SUN gauge theory coupled to an adjoint fermion has a special point in parameter space where it develops n equals one supersymmetry in two plus one dimensions. And Witten, uh, 20 years ago, computed the Witten index of that theory, and he found that supersymmetry is broken for k smaller than n over two. So that's a hint that something happen is happening at n over 2. And of course, we're discussing the non-supersymmetric theory here, but this is a special point in the parameter space. In fact, the number of the, the, the weighted index for k bigger than n over 2 is entirely consistent with the supersymmetric point lying somewhere here. So this also corroborates, to some extent, this phase diagram. So that's the first hint, that this is the correct bound on the conformal window. And the second hint comes from duality which uh, Francesco already mentioned in great detail, so I won't need to repeat it. The bosonic dual description of this phase transition in QCD ceases to make sense for a uh, small k. So one needs to fix the phase diagram. 
So <clears throat> we must make a leap at this point. We're interested in the strongly coupled regime of this QCD-like theories. And so here one cannot proceed by, at least not at the moment, one cannot proceed by pure logic or deduction. One has to make a leap and then make consistency check. So it's useful, in fact, to start from the most strongly coupled regime, which is where k vanishes. So the smaller k is, the more, the more strongly coupled the theory is, because the lighter are the gluons, at least in some sense. So the, va the theory with vanishing k and vanishing mass is, as I said, the closest analog to the four-dimensional gauge theory, and it has time reversal symmetry. So let's start from the adjoint QCD. We make the following conjecture. This conjecture cannot be proven, but it can be subjected to many checks that will, I'll, I'll review some of them. So our conjecture is that SUN gauge theory with an adjoint fermion at vanishing mass and vanishing churn Simons level flows in the deep infrared to a certain finite T QFT and a decoupled Majorana fermion. The Majorana fermion can be identified with the Goldstino due to spontaneously broken supersymmetry. That's why I denote this particle by G. So indeed, uh, there is a natural interpretation to the Goldstino because uh, this theory has supersymmetry, which we believe is spontaneously broken, but the emergence of this topological field theory with this funny indices is quite mysterious. There is no semi-classical computation that would suggest that this theory, that this is the long distance topological field theory in this model. So one has to, so what are the consistency checks for this uh, weird proposal? First of all, remember that uh, there, was a there was a one form symmetry due to the center of the gauge group that did not act on the matter fields, and we had to match the anomaly. So I won't explain how, I don't have time for that, but this topological field theory turns out to have the same uh, one form symmetry and exactly the same anomaly. The second point is that you could say that chern simon theories can never be the right answer in this, for this type of question, because chern simon theories break time reversal symmetry. If you change the orientation of space-time, the chern simons coupling inverts, uh, goes to minus itself. And therefore, it, it's just inconsistent to make this kind of conjecture, because this is a time reversal invariant theory, and this is a chern simons theory, so it's not time reversal invariant. So the point is that there are some sparse, uh, interesting chern simons theories, which are time reversal invariant. Consider, for example, level rank duality. Looking at this formula and plugging k equals to zero, we observe that this theory is time reversal invariant. So time reversal symmetry is not manifest, but it exists. So this is a surprising fact about this one particular chern simons theory. It's not true for all of them. There are, it's a sparse set, and we don't know exactly uh, the full set. We just know of some examples. And furthermore, uh, Yuji, for example, last year in Tel Aviv, uh, gave a very nice review of the time reversal anomaly of this time reversal invariant chern simons theory. And this was the answer. And now we can do an interesting consistency check, mod 16. Matching two numbers mod 16 is almost like as good as matching two numbers in four dimensions, right? So the infrared anomaly is given by one from the Goldstein particle, the Majorana fermion, and then this from the topological field theory, and you get this. And this is exactly the same as n squared minus one, which is the number of fermions in the ultraviolet mod 16. So you see that uh, miraculously the anomalies match. So <clears throat> it may appear somewhat surprising philosophically that the massless theory is actually deconfined. So it has a topological filter in the infrared, which tells you how Wilson lines braid. So the Wilson line in this theory is not confined, unlike the four-dimensional theory. And this may appear surprising, but it's true. So this is the phase diagram for gener general K. Now I'm telling you the answer for general k, not just for vanishing k, and what I told you for vanishing k is a special case. So the general answer is that there are the semi-classical phases which can be understood at one loop, and then there is a new phase which we call the quantum phase, because it's inaccessible to perturbation theory. It, you need a phase transition to get into this phase. And this phase has a new topological field theory and some possible massless Majorana particle at the supersymmetric point. If you go away from the supersymmetric point, then it's lifted, and all that remains is a topological field theory. Now, these transitions here, these two phase transitions, have a new duality, have a new dual description. Uh, this is a, a, a dual description that's not of the type of U gauge theory or SU gauge theory coupled to fundamental flavors. This is about the duality when the matter field is in the adjoint representation. So we claim such a new fermion fermion duality between uh, field theories with adjoint representations. So this dual description is supposed to be another description for this phase transition, 
and it implements uh, this phase transition between these two particular TQFTs. <coughs> OK, now let's go to QCD, which is perhaps more interesting. The adjoint model is simpler, but QCD is more interesting. So <coughs> we basically use similar logic. We try to make a guess and subject, to, subject that guess to an, you know, order 10 different consistency checks and hope that we land on our feet. And it's typically extremely hard to make a guess that works. So we again start from the massless k equals 0 QCD theory, which is a uh, time reversal invariant. And here one assumes the following symmetry breaking pattern. So this is a standard symmetry breaking pattern that's expected in 2 plus 1 dimensional QCD. And we just assume that this is true for the k equals 0 theory. It's important to notice that we have to add the Weson minor term, gamma. That will be very important to match the time reversal anomaly that I'll describe soon. So it's a coset model accompanied by some Weson minor term. So indeed, the ultraviolet theory has 2 nf times nc fermions, 2 nf n fermions, mod 16. So this is the ultraviolet time reversal anomaly. And there is some upcoming work where uh, we prove that this is exactly matched by this uh, coset. And for that computation, it's extremely important to take the Weslumino term into account. In particular, in the CP1 model, this, is th this Weslumino term was described in this recent paper. So here is the new thing. Once you include the churn Simons level k, we propose that uh, the symmetry breaking pattern in 2 plus 1 dimensions is actually modified. So this symmetry breaking pattern, I think, is new. Uh, it, again, follows many, it, it passes many non-trivial consistency checks. And it shows that the churn Simons level can appear in a funny way in the coset. So the coset is this Grossmannian uh, with uh, this kind of weights. And again, we need to accompany this coset model by a Weson minor term to match various things, such as the baryon quantum numbers. So this is the conjecture for the infrared dynamics of QCD. Now, remember that we made previously a conjecture that the conformal window ends here. The conformal window ends here at nf over 2. It's satisfying to see that this conjecture for symmetry breaking is exactly consistent with that. Sorry. I, this conjecture is exactly consistent with that because this symmetry breaking pattern makes no sense if k is bigger than nf over 2. So the proposal for the quantum phase of the theory is exactly consistent with the previous bound on the conformal window. And this is the phase diagram. So QCD in 2 plus 1 dimensions, uh, when the masses are huge, it's boring. It's just that you know, a pure TQFT, which you can understand semi-classically, but then there is a quantum phase. So if you simulate the model on the lattice and you put the masses to zero, you are very likely to end up here. So there will be a coset with some Weson minor term, and the churn simons level would uh, affect the coset in an important way. As I mentioned, in fact, for some special cases, this was actually recently uh, corroborated by an explicit lattice computation, that this phase indeed exists. And again, there is a duality, which uh, Francesco already mentioned very nicely. And there are many other uh, recent very interesting papers uh, giving further evidence to this picture, stringing constructions. And as I mentioned, there is a recent lattice study, which in fact establishes the existence of this phase. So now I want to tell you about some uh, relation between this 3D story and four-dimensional Young-Mills theory. Uh, this is uh, based on some uh, work in progress. So let's uh, just for a second forget about these three-dimensional gauge theories and go back to uh, a turf that we know much better, four-dimensional gauge theories. So again, we can think about four-dimensional young mills theory with an adjoint fermion or four-dimensional young mills theory coupled to NF uh, Dirac fermions in the fundamental representation, namely QCD. So under appropriate circumstances, these four-dimensional theories have uh, degenerate vacua. So ordinarily, Young-Mills theory has a single trivial gapped vacuum. But if theta is pi in some uh, loose sense, there are actually two vacua. And then you can construct domain walls. And there are natural excitations of these gauge theories. And you can ask, what is the effective field theory in these domain walls? So one aspect of this story, which I very briefly mentioned here, is what uh, uh, Francesco already explained, that uh, if you look at the theory on this domain wall, for example, in uh, you know, some NF equals 2 model in four dimensions, you find the CP1 sigma model, and you find the SU2 level 1 topological field theory, exactly mirroring the phase diagram of the three-dimensional theories. So it seems that the three-dimensional theories that we've uh, discussed so far 
are very closely related to the dynamics of domain walls in four-dimensional theories. This is, of course, a general and uh, important correspondence. And one can, for example, show that the anomalies carried by these domain wall theories exactly coincide with the anomalies carried by the three-dimensional theories. So this correspondence is not entirely surprising. So now we can use our vast knowledge of four-dimensional physics to try to, get new, to guess new possible phases of three-dimensional models, or we can also go the other way. Using three-dimensional Bose-Fermion dualities, we can try to guess, uh, we can try to learn something new about four-dimensional physics. So this is a vast subject that I won't have time to cover completely, but I want to give you two examples of uh, new things that we can learn about four-dimensional physics using these three-dimensional tools. So consider, for example, the problem of determining the domain wall theories in super young mills. Super young mills theory in four dimensions has more than two vacua. It has n vacua if the gauge group is SUN and let's say n minus one for SUN and so on. And you may want to understand that you may want to find the theory in these domain walls. The basic idea here is that we would like to identify the effective field theory in these domain walls with these quantum phases in the three dimensional models. So the idea is that these quantum phases in the three-dimensional models, which are in the strongly coupled regime, in fact, appear naturally on domain wall theories in four dimensions. And using this, using this, uh, using this idea, uh, one finds that if the gauge group is SUN, one exactly recovers the Acharya Vafa conjecture, which has been a subject to many, many different tests. So this is the effective domain wall theory for super young Mills theory with gauge group SUN. But many people have tried to generalize uh, the Acharya Vafa conjecture for other simply connected groups, such as SPN, spin n, and it was kind of hard. Uh, the brain constructions are very subtle, and people uh, were not very successful. But using these three-dimensional ideas, the discrete anomalies, the three-dimensional dualities, uh, here are the answers for SPN and spin n. So these are particular TQFTs with some particular levels, and these things pass many consistency checks like tr truly four-dimensional consistency checks that you may require from domain walls in super young mills theory. So you see that uh, the, the, subject, uh, is, the subject of three-dimensional gauge theories has some implications also for questions about four-dimensional physics. So we have seen, here I'm just going to give some references to other recent work, which is uh, pertinent to this discussion. So we've seen that discrete anomalies in uh, two plus one dimensions or are very powerful, in fact. It's a very powerful constraint on dynamics. And it's not limited to two plus one dimensions. Uh, there has been a huge amount of work recently studying discrete anomalies in various situations. And they have implications also for the dynamics of young Mills theory in three plus one dimensions, for instance. So these are some of the references, uh, including uh, many nice works by Francesco and, uh, and others. Now, there is another uh, trend of uh, development, which is interesting, where these discrete anomalies are interpreted as the continuum avatar of Lip lipschultz matisse theorems in condensed matter physics. So lipschultz matisse theorems are theorems about quantum, quantum antiferromagnets, and these are theorems on the lattice, and they state that it's some quantum antiferromagnets cannot have trivial wave functions for the ground state. And the idea is that the continuum avatar is a discrete anomaly because it has essentially the same implications for the ground state wave functions. And this has been shown in many examples, in particular uh, in this paper of Metlitsky and Thorngren. And here there was one example where it works. Also, this correspondence between three-dimensional dynamics and four-dimensional dynamics is quite rich. Uh, here I just gave one esoteric example for, for the domain wall theories of simply connected groups in super young mills. But it has many other uh, interesting implications, and there has been a lot of work on that recently. So I, I would uh, like to thank you for the attention. Questions? When you assume the pattern of uh, symmetry breaking, the Goldstone bosons were in a Cartan symmetric space instead of a general homogeneous space. Is there some general reason for that? You're asking, uh, let me Well, you assumed U goes to U, U divided by U cross U. Well, yeah. one, U one, example, factor here you, one U one factor you can sort of remove for free. Is that what you're asking? 
No, I mean, there could be more general G mod H. Oh, of course, yes. yes. And, but in your case, you have a Carton symmetric space. And so I'm right. wondering if right. with, other, with other groups, you're expecting it to be a Carton symmetric space. That's an excellent special. question, indeed. Um, well, I have no intelligent answer because we have not really explored more general cases. Uh, this, I can tell you additional, this, this proposal uh, passes, a, passes a series of consistency checks, which are, are renormalization group flows, uh, anomalies for flavor symmetries. Uh, in the special case of k equals zero, there is this magic uh, time reversal symmetry that works out. And it also is consist it, it's also consistent with duality uh, uh, via this uh, uh, picture. There is some dual description here, which is very nice. So it seems like a very, very natural uh, guess to make. And we have not really explored more general cases. Well, sure. I, I mean, I, I would expect that in general, it'll be hard to get all the details right. But I was just asking about a general fact. I mean, is the commutator of broken and broken going to be unbroken? I don't know if there is a general theorem guaranteeing that this would be true. For uh, n equals to one uh, supersymmetric Yang mills with gauge groups, exceptional groups, is it known or is there any speculation about domain walls for those? You mentioned the ABCD case. I'm just curious about uh, that. At, at, at present, at present the, the cases which uh, are known uh, are, of course, SUN, which you worked out. And then using these 3D ideas, we can work out SPN, spin N, and also SON. I have not mentioned SON because SON is not simply connected. And when one studies domain walls in SON gauge theories, it's actually very subtle because sometimes even the phase in the bulk is not trivially gapped. There is a TQFT in the bulk in SON gauge theories in some cases. So when you discuss these domain wall theories, they are not sometimes not genuine three-dimensional theories. And the discussion is a little bit more complicated. But it can be, in principle, obtained from this answer. Once you know spin N, you can just. Uh, proceed. So at present, the answers are known for SPN, spin n, SON, and cosets. For uh, the exceptional groups, uh, I don't believe the answers are known. Uh, I know. I, I mean, I know. We know the answer for like one jump. If you jump by one unit, it's pretty easy to guess. The answer is just g level one, where g is, if g is simply connected. But uh, for the more general case, uh, I have not seen uh, any attempt. Okay. Thanks. Um, can you comment about how the adjoint case is, uh, fits together with uh, Unsal's story about uh, 40 QCD on R3 times S1 with small S1? Yes. So perhaps let me go to the, the right slide. Okay, so the question is, the, how uh, is this uh, story consistent with a four-dimensional QCD on a circle, right? So in, in four-dimensional four QCD on a circle, so four-dimensional QCD is really confining. And uh, uh, there is this uh, program that you mentioned whereby they are, it's argued that uh, if you put pro appropriate boundary conditions for the fermion, then the theory remains uh, in the confined phase all the way to small s1. However, that model would not correspond to the k equals 0 model, I think. No. I think that that model would uh, be more similar, albeit not exactly identical, to the k equals n over 2 model, which is exactly at the interface between uh, this new phase and the, and the large k phase, which is weakly coupled. But that also is not completely. That, that's also, that, that proposal is also not entirely uh, consistent. So it, it's not uh, at present clear to me if this uh, has anything to do with uh, the small S1 compactification. There's no further question. Let's thank uh, Zohar. <laughs>
Okay, so the next speaker is uh, mm -hmm. David de Gaio. Topological holography and chiral algebras. Okay, very good. So uh, I'm going to present some work and then, sorry. I'm going to present some work that in progress with Kevin Costello. Um, it's uh, in progress. We haven't written the paper yet, but I think the results are quite solid. And I just couldn't resist giving a string theory talk at the string theory conference, which hasn't happened in a long time for me. <laughs> so what's the general motivation? Kevin Costello has been following this idea that it should be possible to give some purely topological presentations of some aspects of holography. You should be able to discuss some topological twists of supergravity or superstring theory as the holographic dual of twisted quantum field theories, topologically twisted quantum field theories. So this gives a sort of topological holography in the sense that both the twisted quantum field theory and this twisted supergravity presumably make sense on their own. And so you get a sort of a correspondence between two consistent uh, systems. On one side, you have some collection of protective correlation functions. On the other side, you have some topological dynamics. And the advantage of doing something like that is that this might be rigorously probable. Uh, you may be able to do exact calculations, uh, prove this version of holography, but at the same time, it's still quite rich. You can have loops of supergravity or super strings. Uh, so if you can accomplish this, you really get a fully solvable model of holography. Um, perhaps analogous or generalizing things like geometric transitions. Um, now, part of the possible payoffs might be insights on what are the non-perturbative or perturbative aspects of superstring theory or supergravity in the Ramon backgrounds. But also, you might gain some non-perturbative non definitions of some topological, topological string theory. And of course, you might gain some mathematics in the sense that the process of the results that you are proving will be rigorous, so it will be mathematically interesting. So I'm going to focus on a very particular example. Uh, I, would, I should say that although I keep saying topological twist, I perhaps should just say twist in the sense that often uh, I'm going to look at systems in which, which are not fully topological, in which perhaps there will be an holomorphic dependence on some coordinates. So a particularly beautiful example is the two-dimensional chiral algebra, which has been found within four-dimensional and equal Chukic theories by a collection of authors. So this chiral algebra is, a, is presented as the cohomology of a certain unusual combination of supersymmetry and superconformal symmetry. So it's only available in, for the equal to superconformal gauge theories. So you get some operators of the, bulk, of, the, of the physical theory, which dressed by some functions of the position, end up having holomorphic correlation functions. This is not just a, uh, a fun game. If you want to do conformal bootstrap of four-dimensional equal to theories, you need to understand this chiral algebra first. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting subject. It, it really gives beautiful chances of classifying four-dimensional equal to theories, for example. Uh, the chiral algebra itself is pretty straightforward to describe for Lagrangian theories. It's a gauge beta gamma system. So you can write down a two-dimensional action for it. There are some uh, fields of spin one half that come from hypermultiplets, and then there is some two-dimensional gauge field. Uh, now, it's possible that this chiral algebra can be given a alternative definitions. This sort of combination of supercharges is quite unusual. Uh, there are some indications that there might be other ways to obtain this algebra, starting from more conventional type of twists, perhaps holomorphic topological twists, uh, where you treat you pick a supercharge for which uh, two directions are topological and the other two holomorphic, and perhaps deforming it in some way. Uh, we'll see some evidence of that. Now, I want to focus on four dimensional equal four supermills which is in particular for the equal two theory. Uh, this corresponds to a parallel algebra defined by an adjoint beta gamma system. So there are two fields which are valued in the joint of the gauge group. 
this is a this is several surprising properties. First of all, it inherits some extra supersymmetry. So the four dimensional unical two parallel algebras are purely bosonic objects. But the one that comes from for the unical four have an equal four super Virasoro symmetry. To see how the Karal algebra looks like, it has a two, four infinite towers of primary fields, at least in large n. Sorry, let me say it properly. I'm going to describe to you the, the n equal four super, this n equal four Karal algebra for a UN gauge, for UN gauge theory, where n is very large. Then all the operators are just multi traces built from some elementary ingredients. Elementary ingredients as single trace operators are symmetrized traces of these uh, beta gamma systems, polynomials in these beta gamma systems, perhaps dressed, decorated by some extra contributions from a ghost or a derivative. So there are two bosonic towers and two fermionic towers. Inside here, when n is equal, when the sum of these numbers is two, you find some currents for SU2. There is an SU2 global symmetry this system has, which comes from the Symmetry, one of their symmetries of finical phosphor mills, part of their symmetry of finical phosphor mills. Inside this tower, you find the stress tensor at the bottom, and here you find some supercurrents. There is also a hidden uh, emergent, sorry, global symmetry which rotates these two towers into each other, but does not seem to have a physical meaning within nickel four super mills, so I will ignore it. Now, if you are familiar with topological strain theory, you might recognize this action is the dimensional reduction of holomorphic transamons theory. It's the volume theory of uh, some deep brains which appear in the topological B model. And so this, you can take this as the first hint that there might be as an alternative construction of this Karal algebra. Now, but for now, let's just let's proceed with our objective. I want to find some way to compute the correlation functions, the OPE, so this Karal algebra, in the holographic dual. So I want some kind of a twisted version of supergravity or superstrings on ADS5 times S5. Uh, now, I should stress that these correlation functions will depend on n in an interesting way. There will be one over an expansion, a standard tooth expansion. And so if we want to compute the full Karal algebra, you will need to do at least I mean, this perturbation theory in 1 over n, you'll need to do loops in supergravity, in superstrings. Now, Bonetti and Rastelli have already shown that if you take the lowest of the climb mode on ADS5 times S5, um, it localizes which is Simon's theory in ADS3. And so it gives you the, the very first non trivial element of one of the towers. So the challenge is to do the whole, the full colossal -like reduction, if you want, and recover all these towers and all their interactions. It's a bit daunting. Uh, doing a direct twist of supergravity is challenging and not something I actually would enjoy doing, neither Kevin. So instead, we tried to just guess. Uh, we take a page from, uh, from, from Nati. Uh, we, we made an, a reasonable guess and see if it works. So as a, as a shortcut, it's going to be the following. I'm going to go back to the very def derivation of holography. I'm going to start from flat space, understand how to twist flat space, and then how to deep brains in flat space back react to geometry. So rec recall you know, how Maldacena derived the ADS-CFT. You start from ND3 brains in flat space. You back react. Here you find the purely supergravity background, pure supergravity background, which has some, but the D3 brains have been replaced by a smooth throat. At this point, this is supposed to be fully equivalent to this in the sense that if you do open closed strings in this background, that should be the same as closed strings here. So we don't know how to do that. And then there is a scaling limit or the coupling limit, which here gives you the gauge theory and here just gives you the horizon region. Okay, very standard. So I want to do the same in the topologically twisted theory. So what do we have? First of all, there is a natural choice of a topological sector for type to be superstrings. Uh, this is called the B-model topological string. 
is defined whenever you have something like a fork time scalar BL. And uh, it's essentially gravity theory of complex structure deformations. It's a quantum version of Kodara Spencer theory. It was in, introduced by, by these authors, it's the BCOV model. And I think it's, uh, it will be soon an anniversary of the introduction of this model. Uh, that's why it's red. So, so this is one fact. And then there is another fact that if you look at D-brains, which wrap and are true inside R4, and some holomorphic manifold in the Calabial, there is some topological sector for that too, which is governed by open uh, topological strings. And the volume theory of the open topological strings is the dimensionally reduced uh, holomorphic chain Simons theory. So you start seeing the, the sort of actors we wanted to see. So let's look at the tree brains. How do the tree brains look like? Well, in this topological theory, the tree brains wrap R2 times C inside C3. So we're looking at the model topological open strings on C. What's the volume action? Well, dimensional reduced holomorphic chain Simons, which two fields in the joint, it's then equal for Karel algebra. So at least the starting point seems reasonable. I've not proven to you that this topological twist is, this, is equivalent to the one that uh, was used in the original definition, but it's plausible. And perhaps you don't even care. After all, if you're after some topologically twisted version of holography, uh, we might derive it from the physical holography or not. You might just try to do holography within topological string theory. So we take n topological brains, we are C inside C3, we back react. And what is the back reaction? So this, this D brains wrap in C will source some Kodara Spencer field, which is a complex structure deformation. It removes the origin, so it removes this plane from C3 and deforms the geometry. And it turns out that the deformation is SL2C, it's the deformed conifold, which is very nice and quite unexpected to me. Uh, see, one beautiful aspect is that uh, the decoupling limit is now automatic. Uh, the complex structure does not see the decoupling limit. Perhaps if you kept track of the killer parameter or the killer metric, you, you would see you need to do an extra step, but you don't need a killer metric to, to be modeled. So if you want to see some details of how that happens, see, if you and V are the coordinates transverse to the brain, and this is the coordinate along the brain. This is the complex structure deformation. You can integrate it. You get new holomorphic functions, which are not holomorphic before the deformation, but they're holomorphic after. And the holomorphic functions just satisfy this equation, which is the deformed manifold. Uh, if you compute the period of the holomorphic form, which controls the uh, interactions of the of the Kodara Spencer theory. It's n. So this is perfectly analogous to what happens in the, in the physical theory. In the physical theory, you get some S5 in your geometry, which has n unit of flux. You're going to get replace the brains with some S3, which n unit of flux. Now, the original geometry here had an SU2 rotating the two transverse directions, U and V. And that SU is still there. It acts from the right on this two by two matrix. But now there is a completely new emergent SL2C that acts on the left. So you see the emergence of conformal symmetry that you should see when you have back, when you do holography, when you do a back reaction of the brains. Indeed, the deformed conifold is a real manifold, it's pretty much a DS3 times S3. There is a nice projection on, onto a DS3, which is a S2 invariant. So with it, whose fiber is the S3 rotated by the SU2. Um, you can actually even write a killer form if you want, which has this SU2 times SU2C uh, isometry, which I guess helps make sure that the theory, uh, I mean, the killer form can be useful for regularizing the theory, I assume. So this helps showing that these symmetries are not anomalous. Uh, so how do we proceed now? One way is to just do Kaluza Klein reduction. We take our Kodara Spencer theory in the district tensor 3 and reduce on S3. And so what do we get? We get some topological theory in the S3, 
which has an infinite tower of topological high, high spin fields. Each, if you pick the correct boundary conditions, each of these fields are going to give you some Karl, Karl operator at the boundary. And the quantum numbers of these fields are precisely the ones uh, we needed here. You get four towers. These two come from vector fields, these two come from other ghosts of the Kodara Spencer theory. Okay, so we're in a good shape. Now we just need to do calculations. We need to really do Witten diagrams in this setup and compute two point functions, three point functions in the OPEs. And actually, working on the S3 is not that convenient. It was just useful to understand what was going on. Uh, you can sort of lift the boundary conditions back to the conifold and just discuss the Kral algebra plural in that setup. So the boundary of the conifold is, roughly speaking, uh, a CP1 times CP1 with a line bundle on it. There is a CP1 which is rotated by SHUC. And there is a CP1 which is rotated by SU2. You can look for boundary conditions just in the standard holographic dictionary, where there are some fields which blow up as they approach the boundary, but only in one specific point of the boundary. And perhaps decompose in some spherical harmonics on the other CP1. And this gives you your tower of fields. And you can do now calculations in Kodara Spencer theory. So what have we done? For now, we did three level true and three-point functions, uh, just to sort of set up the, make, make sure that the formalism makes sense. Uh, the next step, of course, is to try to do a systematic one over an expansion, uh, learn how to do loops. Hopefully, we will not actually need to do loops, and there will be some smarter way to do it. Uh, we haven't found it yet, but uh, we're looking. One possibility that we find interesting is that you can sort of use giant gravitons, which means extra deep brains in the geometry, as generating functions for, for infinite towers of these fields. We have a very vague hope that perhaps some holomorphic anomaly equations some other, or something like that will allow us to, to set up some, some recursive uh, procedure to do all loops. But it's still a work in progress. So, what else can we do? There are many different extensions that one can pursue. Uh, first of all, I should point out, see, the B model and the von Conifold has been studied before, and not the first, the first look at the theory, clearly. Um, but somehow in the past, people focused on some very specific class of complex structure deformations. Uh, so the von Conifold is, is an example of a class of geometries which Admit the Dagra Witten, Dagra Vatha, sorry, Dagra Vatha uh, <laughs> description in terms of a matrix model. Sorry, I've been doing a lot of condensed matter physics, as you might have noticed. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry for giving a whiplash from 3D uh, quantum field theory, string theory. Uh, but that's fine. So, anyway. So the way to understand that Gravafa in this setup is that this n equal 4 super Virasoro has odd generators. Uh, and you can use one of them to twist it. If you twist it, instead of getting a Karal algebra, you just get a, a ring of a collection of operators which are essentially trace of x to the n. And that is precisely the, the Gravafa description, the sort of observable you would have in Gravafa. So you can make contact with things that are already known. By the way, I forgot to mention, uh, it's actually quite amazing that not only this Cordera Spencer theorem on SL2C has this enhanced conformal symmetry which appears out of nowhere, it also has some hidden odd symmetries. Cordera Spencer theory sometimes has odd symmetries, and this one has just the ones you need for getting n equal 4 super or is the, the global n equal 4 super, super conformal symmetry. So that's nice. Now, of course, you can ask, how can we modify the setup? One thing that I like is to add flavor for the unicode 4. Now, this is a bit problematic because it tends to break conformal invariance. It gives a beta function. But as I'm doing things in topologically twisted theory, so unitarity is not a big deal, you can compensate for that by adding ghost hypermultiples. 
dat we moeten weer van statistics. So if you add uh, k flavor, k hypermultiplets and k ghost hypermultiplets, you get a u k slash k homomorphic and Simon's theory coupled to your Kodara Spencer theory. Amusingly, it turns out that if you want to have homomorphic and Simon's theory without anomalies, you need to have this sort of u k slash k. And the anomaly in the phological statistic theory manifests itself as the beta function in the, in the Fourier setup. Other things you can do is to orbifold the, the setup. There are these four dimensional equal quivers in the shape of AD graphs, extended A, AD, um, which are associated with S5 times S5 mod gamma, where gamma is a sub, discrete subgroup of S2. And you can, of course, do the same quotient of the deformed conifold. So I assume this, this will go through. Now, besides the objective of doing all loop calculations, um, what are the things I would like to do in the, in the long term? Well, first of all, this cannot be working only for the deformed conifold. I mean, there must be some general story about local Calabiaus. Uh, I don't know exactly which local Calabiaus will have something like this boundary car algebra, but I would like to understand that. Uh, I find it interesting that this car algebra essentially gives you a non perturbative definition of the B model in the deformed conifold. I would like to convert, compare it with other. Uh, tentative non perturbative definitions of, of, uh, of the B model. Uh, and also, I would like to understand the relation to integrability. There is a beautiful story about uh, BCOV on local Calabiaus with integrable hierarchies, which I've not been able to connect yet to what we've been doing. I want to stress this is really a, a nice solve of model of holography. You know, it's, it's essentially free. Right, the Carl algebra is essentially free. But on the other hand, um, you get the standard matrix uh, counting, proof of expansion, and so on, and you match it with the string theory. It's somehow closer to the usual holography than other solvable models like vector theories. Uh, perhaps it can help to, it, it can help understand things like the, these, these ideas that maybe you can see ADS at a very short radius from free gauge theory or things like that. So I'd like to revisit those ideas using these tools. And also questions like, you know, various pos the, the possibility of giving alternative non-perturbative definitions of string theory. So there are all sort of little things you can change here. Uh, for example, when you do the Karal algebra, you could have used UN plus K slash K. You get a algebra, you get a Karal algebra which has a few more fields than the than the standard one. And this was a, I mean this sort of idea was explored by 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 Waff and other collaborators before. And this seems to give you an alternative non perturbative completion of uh, of, of string theory in uh, in the size and SS5, uh, which has some extra non unitary uh, modes going around. So anyway, I think this will be a fun uh, fun playground. And this was just one example, this Karal algebra. There are so many more that can be explored. Okay, I think I'm done. So. so in in on the ADS three side, you can orbifold the ADS three. And you can get a BTZ black hole. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, on the boundary, the central charge is negative. So did you check that the entropy matches? No. It's a nice question. Yes. Very beautiful. Uh, so you have given a space-time uh, derivation of this duality. Is there any prospect of a more microscopic worksheet embedding of this topological string theory into the physical f 2 string theory? I think it should be possible. Uh, in, I mean, on one hand, you you could check if the pure spinner string and it is five times five can localize to to the model topological string. This That's might great. be plausible. Yes, Robert. It, 
Well, so I was using just prop giant gravitons, but it's true that you could back react them farther and get more complicated geometries. Uh, I, I do not know. I mean, it should be straightforward. The, the back reaction is very similar to the one caused by the original brains. They are the same brains. That's a beautiful talk. Do you have any guess what the answer would be for general local Calabriao? Would it still be some theory living on the boundary or more complicated? Well, if you want conformal symmetry, you need somehow SL2C to be acting on this local Calabriao. That should be possible, right, with examples where that's the case. Uh, but if you don't constrain yourself with Caral algebra, I think that the, the possibilities might be bigger. So I don't I don't know exactly what you know how to pick the correct boundary conditions. Here I treated very asymmetrically the two CP ones. Uh, I don't know if I need to have some kind of Lagrangian splitting of the boundary that allows me to do something similar. If there are no other questions. Let's thank David. <laughs>
I'll focus on theories with 3D n equals 2 supersymmetry, but enjoy some infrared or cyber dualities. And I'll also be focusing on just identifying dual pairs of co-dimension 1 objects in these theories, so in particular, boundary conditions. And then we can ask, given such dual pairs of boundary conditions, uh, can we understand the resulting equivalences of the underlying mathematical objects? Since we're in a fairly supersymmetric situation, we have some hope of making some of these statements uh, mathematically rigorous as well. So as I mentioned, I'll be focusing on boundary conditions, but in fact, it's uh, very natural and useful to study boundary conditions and interfaces concomitantly, and there are at least two reasons for doing so. Uh, the first is that if we're given a boundary condition B in some theory T, and we're also given an interface I, and in particular a duality interface, so some co-dimension one object that mediates the transformation of operators between a theory T and its dual theory T check, then we can consider the composition or uh, the collision of the duality interface with the boundary condition B and produce a dual boundary condition B check and theory T check. So because the operators, uh, so because the duality interface composes with the boundary conditions, we can hopefully identify some very simple boundary conditions in one theory and then generate uh, some interesting and perhaps more intricate dual pairs by this collision process. And the second reason, which I'll uh, mention more towards the end of the talk, is that in favorable circumstances, if we've identified a pair of dual boundary conditions, then we can actually stitch them together to build a duality interface in the first place. So these objects uh, play well together, and we'll see that later on. So the setup, as I've mentioned, is to study some 3D n equals 2 quantum field theories that are dual in the sense that we start with two distinct, two or more distinct ultraviolet Lagrangian descriptions, and they flow to a common fixed point. So some simple examples that you can hang your hat on and that will appear later in the talk. Uh, on, uh, on the one hand, we can start with n equals 2 super QED with gauge group E1 and turn Simon's level 0. And which also has two chiral multiplets of charge plus and minus one. And on the other hand, there's a theory that's often called the XYZ model, the theory of three chirals coupled by a cubic superpotential. And it's been known uh, that these famously share a common infrared fixed point. Um, and another perhaps even more uh, basic example is just the supersymmetric uplift of some level rank dualities. And this uh, level rank duality of unitary gauge groups uh, will be one of my examples today. So we'd like to identify dual boundary conditions, and then what I mean by that in the context of these infrared dualities is to identify UV boundary conditions B and B check, and they're dual if uh, they flow to a common a superconformal boundary condition in the infrared. So let me establish a little bit of notation in the setup for the rest of the talk. Um, everything I'll be doing today is semi-classical. At the level of the Lagrangian, all of the theories I'm studying will enjoy a simple Lagrangian description. There will be yang mills chern simons theories with some matter and interactions. And we'll study these theories on a half-space geometry, so R11 or R2 in, in Euclidean signature times the half-line. And we'll call this coordinate transverse to the boundary x perp, so the boundary condition will live at x perp equals zero. And we can already get a very rich class of boundary conditions, even if we ask that they preserve essentially as much symmetry as possible. And in particular, we'd like these boundary conditions to preserve some amount of supersymmetry, and they can preserve half the supersymmetry. And in particular, they're allowed to preserve any superalgebra such that the supercharges don't anti-commute to uh, translations perpendicular to the boundary. And moreover, um, from our uh, UV perspective, we'd also like to have uh, we'd like these boundary conditions to have a chance of flowing to a superconformal boundary condition in the IR, so we'll ask that the boundary conditions preserve the 3 dr symmetry, and those, so there's a natural choice of superalgebra um, that enjoys these properties, and that's a 2D02 uh, superalgebra on the boundary. So we'll be studying half BPS boundary conditions that preserve 0 2 supersymmetry. That's our basic setup. Okay, so before I tell you about dual pairs of boundary conditions, let me say a few words about how we define or build a consistent boundary condition in the first place. Uh, the first step is just a bit of a bookkeeping for convenience, so I don't really want to go into the details, but I'll point out the salient uh, features. Uh, so it's convenient to rewrite our n equals 2 theory in the language of 0 2 supersymmetry so that we make manifest essentially the supersymmetry that we'd like our boundary condition to preserve. 
It's just a matter of, of convenience to do so. And uh, so let me draw your attention to the result of doing this exercise and decomposing the 3D n equals 2 Lagrangians and, and multiplets in the 0 2 formalism. So one thing that happens is if we started with a 3D chiral multiplet phi 3D, it decomposes into two kinds of matter multiplets with respect to 0 2 superalgebra. The first is a chiral multiplet phi, which contains a complex scalar. And it also contains a right-handed fermion psi plus, where the chirality is with respect to the 2D Lorentz group. And it also decomposes into what's called a Fermi multiplet psi, which contains the fermion of the other chirality as its lowest component. And it also contains uh, an auxiliary field, which in particular on shell is equal to the perpendicular derivative of the complex scalar L phi. So briefly, the kinetic terms in this x perp direction transverse to the boundary get repackaged when we do this kind of rewriting as interaction terms from the perspective of a 0 2 model. And uh, these often are called J terms in the literature, but we get some kind of superpotential like this a Fermi multiplet psi multiplying some holomorphic function of the chiral fields. And more precisely, if we do this decomposition, say just for a free 3D chiral in n equals 2 supersymmetry, then we get a term like this, psi delta. Um, and this um, term of this form will come up on the next slide, which is why I'm presenting it uh, right now. And there's one more point I want to make very briefly, which is that there's another kind of interaction term that's possible in a 0, 2 theory in addition to the J term. Uh, it's called the E term, and it will be important for us um, in particular because there's a non-trivial constraint on the E and J terms that they must satisfy if the theory is to preserve supersymmetry in a supersymmetric vacuum, namely that E dot J equals zero. And this constraint will come up for us again later in the talk. Okay, so we've done this repackaging, and now we can ask how we can identify some boundary conditions in our 3D theories. Um, and the idea is essentially just to start from some very simple uh, reference type boundary conditions and then consider a broader class by deformation. So if we have two fields U and V, uh, that you can think of as roughly as conjugate variables on the phase space, like Q and P, then we can start by setting one of them, for instance, V, to zero at the boundary, and then considering some deformations by functions of conjugate. And an intuitive way to think about where boundary conditions like this come from uh, is as follows. So all of our theories, as I said, admit a nice Lagrangian description, and um, in particular, we can just look at the variation of the action and set the boundary terms to zero and identify the boundary conditions in that way. So for example, if I had a term like this, V del per U, exactly as we had on the previous slide, then setting the uh, variation of the boundary term of this Lagrangian to zero gives me the simple boundary condition that I started with. And this deformation by some boundary action, S partial of U, gives me the deformed version. And so it's very easy for me to generate now a large class of supersymmetric boundary conditions if I add a boundary action that's manifestly 0 to supersymmetric. So I can start to generate uh, many boundary conditions in this way. Um, and so I should just tell you now then what are the simple reference boundary conditions that we start with and then, and then generalize. Um, and they're boundary conditions that all of us know and love, namely Neumann and Dirichlet boundary conditions. So here's for the scalars. And more precisely, we should look at the supersymmetric completions of these boundary conditions. Um, and the uh, net result of doing that is that you set either psi at the boundary to zero, the Fermi multiplet, or phi at the boundary to zero, the chiral multiplet. And I want to point out that because of the way the multiplets are structured, we'll either be setting one chirality of fermion to zero at the boundary or the other, uh, never, never both at the same time. Similarly, you can identify reference boundary conditions for the gauge fields. I won't go through any of the details, but again, they're the natural supersymmetric completions of Neumann and Dirichlet boundary conditions. So in particular, the Neumann boundary condition will preserve G gauge symmetry on the boundary, and again, set one chirality of gauge eno to zero. Whereas the Dirichlet boundary condition, which fixes the boundary values of the parallel components of the gauge field on the boundary, um, such a boundary condition is only compatible with gauge transformations that go to constants along the boundary. So the Dirichlet boundary condition preserves a global G symmetry at the boundary and turns out to have the right properties to admit boundary monopole operators. And now there's one more step that I want to tell you to define a consistent boundary condition for these theories. It's very, very similar to the previous step. It's another class of deformation. 
And in particular, there's the option to couple to additional uh, boundary matter, purely two-dimensional matter, again, in a supersymmetric fashion. And of course, this is a very natural thing to do, but I want to stress that sometimes it's actually compulsory that we do this in order to have a consistent boundary condition in the first place. So let me tell you two scenarios where it's mandatory to have some two-dimensional matter. The first is if I had a theory of uh, several chiral multiplets, uh, and they are interacting by some holomorphic superpotential W of phi. And let's say I tried to impose Neumann boundary conditions on all of the chirals at the same time. Then I could compute my E dot J constraint from a few slides ago, and I would find not zero in general, but rather the boundary value of the superpotential. And if I'm trying to impose, impose Neumann boundary conditions and all of the chirals are unconstrained at the boundary, uh, this is not going to be zero. So the fix is to add some additional 2D matter, uh, some Fermi multiplets, that cancel off uh, this extra contribution. And we call this uh, a factorization of the superpotential, borrowing some standard terminology. Now, there's a second and another very sort of simple scenario where you are uh, forced to add some two-dimensional matter. And that's if we just have Neumann boundary conditions on our gauge fields uh, at, gener at generic turn Simon. And, well, remember, we have our 3D setup. We have, in, we're in the presence of a boundary, and the boundary preserves chiral supersymmetry. So you can and should worry that there are non-vanishing anomalies in general. And indeed, there are. You can compute them fairly explicitly. And so in the case of a gauge anomaly, since the Neumann boundary condition on the gauge field preserves the gauge symmetry, you would better add some matter to cancel. OK, so that was all I wanted to say about building boundary conditions for 3D theories uh, with n equals 2 supersymmetry. And now I'd like to move on and tell you a little bit about the construction of dual pairs of boundary conditions. And this is another um, scenario where you'd really like to and need to add uh, additional 2D matter. Because as we've heard uh, in the beautiful talks this morning, that if you're looking um, at some duality, and in particular you want to identify some dual pairs, you would better ensure, if you have some putative dual pair of boundary conditions, that you can match the Atuft anomalies and the flavor symmetries on both sides and often we'll need to add some 2D matter to accomplish this. Um, now, we've heard a bit about Atuft anomalies already, um, but since they're so fundamental to many of our proposals, I just want to say a brief word about how we compute the Atuft anomalies uh, in, our, in our setup. And the central claim is the following, that a three-dimensional fermion whose boundary condition, again, sets one chirality or the other to zero with the boundary, contributes to an anomaly polynomial half the contribution of a purely two-dimensional fermion of the same chirality. And it's not that hard to argue uh, for this outcome. So let's imagine that we just have some 3D fermion, and we'd like to compute its contribution to the Atuft anomaly polynomial for the flavor symmetry that's just the usual U1 that's rotating this fermion, and it has charge 1. Um, and it's not hard to do. What we do is just add, you can add a real mass term to the fermion, flow to the IR, compute the anomaly, and then use the UVIR equivalents to match them. And when you do this, there's two effects that you need to take into account. Uh, the first, as we've heard already earlier today, is that when you're integrating out these massive fermions in 3D, you'll generate a background churn Simons term at a level that depends on the sign of the real mass that you've added. The second effect, which is important in the presence of boundary, also depends on the sign of the real mass that you've added. In particular, you may or may not have normalizable edge modes that survive on the boundary. And you can uh, just solve the Dirac equation and see this uh, right away, uh, whether or not you have some kind of uh, edge mode that survives. So you can sum these effects together. Each of them individually depends on the sign of the real mass, but the net effect is not. And indeed, for these two options of boundary condition, you recover the claim. They contribute half uh, in a suitable normalization. What a 2D. This computation is very easy to generalize. So that's all I'll say about it for now. And finally, I want to introduce one more uh, piece of technical machinery uh, before we uh, get into our dual pairs. And because I'm in a situation where I have a good amount of supersymmetry, then if I have some proposed dual pair of boundary conditions where I've matched the Atuft anomaly polynomials, I've matched the flavor symmetries, it's nice and I should, in, in fact, do a slightly more refined check. And in particular, I can compute some index and try to match the indices for my proposed dual pair. So a dual pair of boundary conditions should have matching index if, if I'm computing an RG invariant quantity, as I am. 
And such an index has been in, uh, studied in the literature before. Uh, it's called the half index. So it's some quantity that depends on a theory T and its boundary condition P. Um, we generalize um, a bit the uh, applicability of half index. But let me just say that I'll take the following perspective on the index in this talk. I'll view it as some kind of trace over boundary local operators with a particular supersymmetric insertion. So there's some variables x that keep track of flavor symmetries, and there's some variable q that keeps track, essentially, of the spin of the operators with some shift by the R charge. And I count with sign uh, these boundary local operators. And as is familiar um, in many other indices, uh, the count that I'm doing is non-trivial only in the cohomology of a supercharge, in particular one of the two supercharges that my boundary conditions preserve. So I'm counting Q-closed modes of local operators on the boundary. Um, and there's one more thing that I'd like to say about the half index, one more perspective on it, and that's um, that you can perhaps usefully view the half index as the vacuum character of some kind of boundary chiral algebra. So the boundary condition supports some interesting local operators. In general, they have some non-trivial OPE with one another. And if you just look at the superalgebra, you can see that translations perpendicular to the boundary are Q-exact. And in Euclidean signature, translations in the anti-holomorphic direction on the boundary are Q-exact. But uh, translations in the holomorphic direction are not. And this is the right kind of structure uh, for a chiral algebra to emerge. Uh, and, and this half index is computing some character for that underlying uh, structure. OK, so now let me give you an example, finally, of a dual pair of boundary conditions. And I'll give you an example for the supersymmetric version of one of the level rank qualities that we saw earlier. Um, and you can actually obtain this example of dual pairs of boundary conditions by combining these two UVIR proposals. So each of them uh, can be checked independently, and shortly we'll just combine them to get a dual pair. Uh, so the first is that given some supersymmetric gang mills chern simons theory, with some gauge group G in this level, um, and I give it a Dirichlet boundary condition, the claim is that this flows in the infrared to a chiral WZW model supported on the boundary. And in the bulk, there's just the usual topological field theory associated with Chern Simons. In particular, it has no non trivial local degrees of freedom. And the second proposal is again take supersymmetric Yang Mills Chern Simons theory, gauge group G, and now with this negative level, and I give it a Neumann boundary condition. Then firstly, I must couple it to a two-dimensional theory in order to cancel the gauge anomaly. And the claim is that this flows in the deep infrared to the co coset conformal field theory supported on the boundary. So if I combine these two proposals with level rank dual gauge groups, and I take the simplest possible choice for the 2D matter, just k fundamental Fermi multiplets, then I obtain the statement of the dual pair. So the UN gauge theory with the Neumann boundary conditions and k fundamental Fermis is dual to SUK gauge theory with the Dirichlet boundary condition. And notice that K fundamental Fermis have a natural SUK flavor symmetry rotating them. And similarly, SUK gauge theory with the Dirichlet boundary condition, remember, preserves a global SUK on the boundary. Um, and you can compute the anomalies, uh, Tuft anomalies, and find the matching as well. And of course, the half indices match. And I won't go into detail since I didn't tell, tell you how we compute them. But in particular, on both sides of the duality, you can show non-trivially that they're equal to the vacuum character of the chiral WZW model that I, that I claimed. Um, and this example, OK, it's, it's perhaps reassuring or uh, expected to some of you in the audience, because the boundary conformal field theories that I claimed you obtain in the infrared are, in fact, level rank dual in the two-dimensional sense. So this is uh, perhaps a reassuring example. But we can do similar studies in, for more general dual pairs. Um, for instance, Aharoni dualities and theories with more general matter and interactions. And again, we find a plethora of dual pairs of boundary conditions. And, we and the ones we find are often the simplest possible choices that are consistent with the conditions that I've outlined so far. Um, and again, the equality of the half indices in all of these examples is a shadow of a much richer isomorphism uh, of algebras. And I'll just mention that there's work in progress by these gentlemen studying this further. So now I want to say a little bit about duality interfaces, because I claimed that you can build duality interfaces from dual pairs of boundary conditions, and I want to just sketch in a picture how that works. So if I start with some theory T, and I endow it with some left and right boundary conditions, B and B shriek, 
I choose boundary conditions such that if I couple them back together, they flow to the identity interface in the infrared. So something like a Dirichlet on one side and a Neumann on the other would have this property. On the other hand, I can dualize the theory on a half space to the dual theory T check and boundary condition B check. And again, try to couple these boundary conditions together consistent with the flavor symmetries and factorization of the super potential and all of these things. And um, I'll obtain a duality interface uh, if indeed this theory flows in the infrared and to the trivial interface. So this is sort of the cartoon prescription of how you would try to build these things and uh, assuming everything in the diagram commutes. We can do this very easily with the level rank dual example. So let's start with SUK gauge theory and give it Neumann and Dirichlet boundary conditions on the gauge field on the two sides, and then dualize the Dirichlet side, since we know the dual, and get UN gauge theory with Neumann boundary conditions and K fundamental Fermis, and then SUK with Neumann on the other side. And well, if I couple them back together, there's not much I can do. All I can really do is just gauge the SUK flavor symmetry of the Fermis, and the result is just that the duality interface for this level rank dual pair is nothing but um, a 2D Fermi multiplet that it furnishes a bifundamental representation of the gauge groups. And again, you can do consistency checks on this. So in my last couple minutes, let me just say very brief words about some work in progress with Tudor de Mofta. So we understand dual pairs of boundary conditions. We know how to construct duality interfaces. And we can have a little fun with geometry using some of these results. And you might anticipate that there are some geometric applications because as usual, we have a six dimensional uh, two zero theory and we uh, know how to compactify it on some manifold with a suitable twist and obtain a supersymmetric theory in the transverse space that is in some sense labeled by geometric data. And in the context of three manifolds and N equals two theories, this goes by the name of 3D, 3D correspondence. And these gentlemen have told us how to associate to an abelian Chern Simons matter theory, certain triangulated three manifolds. And so in particular, SQED and XYZ, under their prescription, um, are associated to these two triangulated three manifolds. And in fact, these two three manifolds are actually just different triangulations of the same three manifold. And that's nice because these theories are IR dual. And in the far IR, uh, the theory shouldn't care about the fine details of the metric, like the triangulation. Um, and so that's kind of a consistency check of this proposal. But now, you might imagine trying to um, implement a change in triangulation geometrically by a cobordism. So imagine some four manifold that's interpolating between these two configurations and it has on the boundary these two uh, triangulated three manifolds. So you can study a four manifold in this way and the field theoretic avatar from the six dimensional origin should be exactly the zero two duality interface that's implementing the transformation between SQED and XYZ. And if you're interested in four manifolds, you can continue this kind of logic and try to figure out what basic operations in four manifolds correspond to 2D duality interfaces. And you can see that different ways of gluing a four simplex together using this kind of cobordism picture has a field theory analog, which is the IR equivalence of sequences of these duality interfaces. And so we've constructed the interfaces and found some interesting functional identities. And we hope that this triangulated perspective will be a nice complementary approach to understand some four manifold geometry using the physics of 2D theories and chiral algebras. Now, I'm out of time, so I'll just flash some interesting adjacent areas and interesting works in progress and things to do that's related to our work. Um, and let me say one thing uh, very briefly. Uh, I mentioned that there's often interesting interplays between bulk quantum field theories and the QFTs supported on the extended operators. And 2D02 theories are interesting and should have rich dualities of their own. And one thing we plan to do is uh, explore this further and we believe we can reproduce and perhaps even generate some new 0-2 dualities in this way. But now let me thank you for your attention. That's all I have. Questions? Thank you for the talk. How much can be done explicitly for in the non supersymmetric case? Really can say. Um, so I hope that, that quite a lot can be done. At this point, I'll just reference uh, that there are some proposed dual pairs of boundary conditions by these authors uh, in, the non in some non supersymmetric dualities. 
And the dual pairs look qualitatively very similar to the 3dn equals 2 versions that we proposed. I believe they've matched the Atuft anomalies, and I would be interested also to see the extension to duality interfaces. I hope that something can be done. There are no other questions. Uh, let's thank Natalie again. I think we should thank all speakers of this session for the wonderful talks they have given. <laughs>